when the cultists of the Triforce of Peas, pizza, painting, and puppers, <laughs> decided that they needed to find a way to reach the masses to increase their numbers, they came up with the podcast known as Trapped Under Plastic. The podcast where the tendies are strong, the set is good looking, and all topics are above average. <laughs> hey! We got a pretty good topic today for you. I didn't say how much above average. No, it's solid C plus. <laughs> yeah, C C plus. You put that little slash in there between the C and C plus, like depending on the mood of the yeah. English teacher that yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I never thought about that. When you're little, you don't really think that adults make mistakes, right? Right. And so you never think about like your teacher giving you a grade based on a bad mood, or like you never think that you go to the dentist and like you get like a root canal and like they could just fuck it up. And you gotta pay for it again, but like yeah. they messed up and it wasn't your fault at all, you know? Do they do that to you? That's the wisdom. That's the wisdom you gain as an adult. Yeah, Is they this did. A segue? Well, it's not a segue. That did actually happen to me though. But I did go to the dentist and I had a thought while I was there, while they were scraping the plaque off my teeth with fucking medieval weaponry. Yes. Uh -huh. You know, in like in like in fifty years, like when 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 Lou's grandchildren are talking to you mm -hmm. and they're like, Grandpa, Grandpa. Did you really go to the dentist and they really scraped shit off your teeth with metal tools? <laughs> that sounds so fucking like, <laughs> what time period am I in, dude? It's, it's torturous, man. It's bone chilling. I, yeah. I, I won't get cleaning. I hate it. Dude, it you, you don't need enamel. Like they talk about <laughs> enamels, the protective layer of your teeth that keep them from fucking decaying, and they just hack away at it. You're dude. like, well, looks like you got a cavity. I wonder fucking why. <laughs> You're exposing the freshness of my teeth every six months, God damn it. Yeah, you got those war picks that you're using <laughs> on my mouth every fucking day. God damn. Okay, so I think it's there's some, some tinfoil hat theory here because- I had a crown put on a little over a year ago, mm -hmm. and I haven't been able to eat on that side of my mouth since. Oh, no. It's so fucked. And then when I went back in, I'm like, hey, uh, you fucking suck at your job. <laughs> um, and he's like, well, yeah, well, here's the number of the, the specialist for the root canals. Yeah. I'm like, oh, so I just paid you like $1,800 Dude. to cause me more pain that I'm going to have to fucking do again and undo all your fucking work. I, that is the exact same situation that I had. Oh my God. I got a root canal. They sucked. I went to a specialist. I paid both times. Fuck this. I, it's, it's, I mean, I had insurance, so I, I had to pay like some amount, but yeah, it's like 1800 bucks or something like that. If you buy a car <laughs> and a year later, the fucking car dies. You get your goddamn money back. At least you get some money back, get right? Something? Yeah. I don't know. There's well, they fix it for free. Yeah. But they don't fix my tooth for free the second time. Yeah. I know mine has like a like a, a warranty or something like that. But what you was You got it? that tooth warranty? Yeah. So I actually went to the, the dentist and I have a cavity under the crown that they put in. And it's, it feels like how how does that happen? I don't know how that happens, but they're like gonna prorate it. But it still costs some number of hundreds of dollars, um, bro. Yeah. Wasn't it their job when they ground down your tooth to a tiny tree stump, a little stub, and then covered it in a fake cap? You would think that nothing would get under the fucking cap, or or the guy that's in there that's doing the grinding. He's a I don't know dentist. Maybe he'd see <laughs> that there's still something something there. I think that it happened after the crown was. Put oh, down. what the fuck is in there? I don't fucking know. I don't what know. Did he just chuck a skittle in there while he was down there. Yeah, he's like, dude, he's like, I'm saving this for later. <laughs> he's like, now you might think we could use such technologies as resin to attach this <laughs> fake tooth to your tooth stump. <laughs> skittles. He just chews on a skittle yeah. and sticks it in there and fucking sticks it down. Good, Done. Good as new. God damn it. And I've been not going so. I was going to have this other appointment with the the root canal specialist people, but it was coming up on Adepticon, and I'm like, I'm not going to fucking worry about it till after Adepticon, because the last thing I want to do is go get this shit done, and then go to Adepticon and feel fucking worse, yeah. and not be able to eat tendies or whatever. Yeah. And so now I've been dragging my feet on calling them back, but thanks for bringing it up, and I feel like, <laughs> like a shitty adult. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. The preamble, lamble, the preamble, lamble mm -hmm. is uh, is fucking locked and loaded today. We got a lot of shit to talk about. Yeah, it came in like a lion, not like a lamble. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Okay, so you got that one. I got. What did I have? Oh, uh, what did I write? Okay, you wrote things. I wrote some things. Um, I got two kind of heavy hitters that usually I talk about dumb shit, but this is going to be uh, like actual things today in the preamble ramble. Okay. Um. 
I'll pose a question to you as I've tried a, yet another uh, wet palette and yet another brand of paint. Yeah. And I tried the exemplar wet palette, which I think my other thing is about that. Yes, um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the wet palette. But then another band of paint in the Broken Anvil Miniatures paints. Um, it feels like in a very short amount of time, we went from having very, very little amount of options in the hobby space for our, what I would describe as consumable products. Whether that's brushes, whether that's paints, whether that's mediums, things that you either had to you had to like make do with things that were made for traditional art or you just the hobby stuff was very small and then what it feels like in like five years it's gone to an exorbitant amount of options yes and i'm going to talk specifically of paint because i think it's the biggest kind of um what's the what's the term for a nail that's like that's 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 higher than the others there's a term. A nail. Yeah, it's the the nail that is fuck someone else. The it last there. nail in the coffin kind of thing? No, but there's a there's the nail that sticks out and that's the one you stub your toe on. So oh. it's, it's the whatever, whatever nail. Okay. It's the it's the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing. It's the it's the, or, the biggest culprit of the okay. issues you're having. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so paints. Um I think at this point, and I'm I'm probably the person that you could look at as the most unqualified and also the most qualified to talk about this because one I'm the person that buys all the new ones and I'm excited for every new paint range and so I was that Nocturna and Miles paint bro it's hot garbage <laughs> um but on the other side I have an experience with all basically every paint range that's ever been made that's not entirely true but it's not that far from truth that I've tried just about everything that's been produced mass produced and they're so similar. At what point does somebody else's new paint range really not do much of anything? I don't other know, than the dude. fact that you're trying to get you're trying to get in on the market. Bro, I don't know. I don't people keep buying them too. Yeah. Which I'm not criticizing that. I'm more like observing it and just surprised by it. Because like I feel the exact same way, way as you. I use all these ranges. They differ in like features by like five, ten percent. And it's just like, okay, like, yeah, a little bit different, you know? Um, but, like, I wouldn't, like, ever feel the need to go out of my way to buy a whole new paint range or, like, sets from a new paint range because, like, I feel so, like, just okay with what I have. And, like, I've tried, like, a couple new ones. They change a little bit, but nothing ever, like, shakes my world where I feel the need to go and research further, you know? Yeah. and I mean, like, and I'm not... This is not knocking on any existing paint range no, out there because keep, keep making them. I don't care. Do whatever you want. Well, that that there, I, I have a bit of a, <laughs> a, di a disagreement with you. Okay, I think the ranges that are out there are good, and they allow us to to give us options for how we feel we paint best, or goes well with our style, or we do we experiment with one and we get comfortable with it. But the cold hard truth is, no paint range alone is going to make you an amazing painter and allow you to do the things you can't do today. But getting accustomed to and proficient with the paint range that you have and learning how to work with it for all its flaws and its strengths will. So I think it's better to, to even that doesn't mean if it has to be a certain range. Like I love using certain colors of different ranges. It doesn't mean you have to own everything of a certain range. But finding the things that you like and then just putting in the hours with them um, is valuable. Now, there's so many out there now. I This is like I kind of have just gotten to this point at, right now. Where now, if another paint range comes out, I, I really honestly want to know what exactly are you doing that doesn't exist through all the market that's here today. Yes. What really are you doing? Re yes. And something like the speed paint range from Army Painter and the contrast range from GW, those are those are a great example of doing something different. Innovations, yes. yes. Or like Scale 75's drop paint made the claim that it is like 
air free through an airbrush, right? Like that is an innovation. If it holds up to that claim, right? Like that, that's worthy of, of, of existing. Cause like a lot of hobbyists have a lot of problems with paint through an airbrush. So it's like, yeah. we created this range specifically to solve that problem for you. Not saying it does that, you know, the kind of, you know, I'm not entirely sure, but like that is a, that is a good idea for innovation. Yeah. Another one of those, which I've been using a lot lately is the shoot. There's an AK interactive line that they, the bottles come in, but they look like the apple barrel paints. Mm hmm and they're, a, they're all a series of a bunch of different colors, and there's a color A and a color B, and they're meant to be a, a, like a base coat and like a, a zenithal highlight, but they keep the saturation like a, like a brighter sky blue and then like a nice navy blue, and they kind of just like melt together well. Obviously, you can mix and match them, but the cool thing about those is they're meant to go through the airbrush and act as your primer. Mm, yeah, see, that's nice. And so then you can also take, time. The, take the drops out of them, which I did for the the model here and still use them as regular paint as I built up my layers um, in mixing. Yeah. So, you know, that has me immediately curious. Like, did they do anything to the the properties of the paint to make it more like a primer, like more like more, more strength and stuff like that, handle abuse better? Or did they just say you can use it as a primer and as normal paint? And forever we've been able to use paint as normal primer, you know? Yeah. Okay. So, there is from my testing there is something with that because the first time i did it i thinned it with water to put through my airbrush to prime it and when i mix it in the cup with my with an old brush mm -hmm. the old brush got like goopy like weirdly like there was some kind of adhesion like it was adhering hard to it okay and then when i used real thinner they i i got their thinner um that's made for this paint for through an airbrush and then i tried just the regular tamia stuff too and both of those worked fine it it didn't do it now it doesn't leave a grit behind on the models, but there's something like when you shoot that through the air through an airbrush, like it feels much more heavy duty, like heavy duty stuff. It doesn't feel like when you thin down, you know, a scale or whatever brand regular paint, where they just feel like they're oh they're they're nice and mellow and whatever. Um, this stuff it like felt right out of the bottle. It was like oh this is this is more heavy duty. I don't know how much okay. I haven't I haven't rubbed any off. I haven't had any issues like priming yeah. and then going right to a brush with it reactivating stuff. So, um, yeah. And I think Goobs did this test where like he like primed a bunch of goblins and then like just painted a bunch of goblins without primer on them and then like did a bunch of like wear tests to see like how much primer actually affects like paint adhesion. Because like we could, we could probably paint our models without primer and be largely okay. As long as we're like airbrushing on paint on plastic is a lot easier than paint brushing it on. Yes, it is. So that that's kind of a caveat. Um, but that's true for primers as well. You aerosol spray them on or you uh, spray them on with a with a uh, airbrush. Some people do the gesso primer, but that's like the vast minority of hobbyists. Yeah. Um, but yeah, back to your point, many paint ranges. At what point do we hit saturation? I don't know. I think that's for the market to discover, right? We put we put ranges out on Kickstarter. Suddenly they're making 50 grand, 20 grand. They're not making yeah. a million, 500,000, right. whatever it is, you know? So Unless you're Duncan's paint range. <laughs> Duncan, Duncan getting that big money. Getting that money. All right, um, all right. Yeah, and I mean, maybe maybe your innovation is, and Duncan's is an example of this, is it's an alternative to colors we all know and love from the GW range. And they work, at least in my experience, they just worked more consistently across the range than the GW paints. And they're in dropper bottles. And they're in dropper bottles. Sometimes you don't need to have this world-changing chemistry innovation yeah. for it to still be something really valuable. Yeah, to yeah. So when everything is so close in performance, the things that separate us are like ease of use or like, you know, creature comfort things. So that that's how you can, you can innovate. You can make your product easier to use, more friendly. Yeah. So that was just kind of on my brain. Okay. Last night, for some reason, it's related to the next thing, which is the wet palette. <laughs> nice. Okay. okay. What What do you got? You got? I want to ask you about Frostgrave. Ask saw, me, bro. I saw you playing it last night. Yeah. I jumped in like in the middle of the stream. Yeah. And friend of the show, uh, one of the greatest uh, podcast guests we've ever had, Don Haney. Don Haney um, was on, which made me think like, I want that son of a bitch on again. <laughs> yeah, dude. I think he'd be totally down to come on again. He's such he's such a fascinating human being. Yeah. What a nice guy. Okay, yeah, so yeah. Uh, enough about S and Don's D. Let's <laughs> let's let's talk about <coughs> Frostgrave. No, I jumped yeah. in so I didn't like get any kind of like the rule stuff. So it's a little bit overwhelming for me to just kind of like you guys are in the midst of doing things. Yeah. However, 
with enough experience in the miniature war games, I felt like I, I caught it pretty quick. Right. And a lot of D twenty rolls, which I'm all immediately a, immediately a fucking fan of. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically all D twenty rolls other than when you're spawning a monster and you have to roll to see what table edge it comes on, one through four. Okay. Um, but otherwise everything is a singular D twenty. Yes. And so it's just mods, utter, right? utter chaos. So it's mods on the D twenty. There right? are mods, yeah, yeah. But it's I think the mods range from plus one to plus five. Um so like it, it probably can get crazier. I mean I played like one fucking game. But that in our game that was the variance. Is the chaos of war. Yeah. Um so like when you roll when you're trying to attack somebody, is like you had a plus to your attack roll, and then they had their static armor number, right? Yeah, so it's a it's a clever system that uses just one dice roll. It doesn't need to use multiple. So you and your opponent, say you're in combat, you both roll a d20, and you add your fight value, and also any other additives. Say you're ginging up on someone with multiple people, uh, you as the attacker get additives. So you roll your d20, and then after you add up all your values, you see who has a higher value. Whoever has higher wins the combat. If you tie, you both hit each other and do damage to each other. <laughs> um, so once you determine who the winner is, uh, and when you are being attacked, you can hit that person and do damage to them, uh, like uh, in Bushido. Uh, so you swing, find the higher number, and then uh, you compare that higher number against your armor, and then the difference that you, uh, in those two numbers is the difference you take in damage. Um, so it's interesting because like higher numbers win, higher numbers do more damage. So when you're winning, it feels like you're often doing large amounts of damage. You're doing between half health and one third health of the opponent, if not just outright killing them in one go. Mm. Like against a, uh, there were NPCs in the game, these cultists that were de defending this cart we were trying to get treasure from, and they had 10 HP and 10 armor. And so if I, if I, with my berserker who has a plus five to his combat score and plus two damage when when uh, damage gets through. If I get like a 15 on that die roll and he rolls, you know, under that 15, I'm killing that guy in one swing. Um, so most characters, or they're called soldiers in the other warbands, um, have more than 10 HP and more than 10 armor. Uh, so that doesn't often happen where you one shot people, but it can happen. Um, it's a very swinging game. And what I like about it is that it doesn't hide that from you. It's like in plain sight. And so... Like, it truly is, to me, a beer and pretzels game. It advertises itself as that. It plays like that. It reads like that. You know, everything about it is like that. And also, it's model agnostic, but there are models for the range as well. So if you don't want to, like, spend time trying to put together a warband and find a bunch of cool models, that's not where you get your hobby joy, you can just use the models in the range. But if you are, they encourage you to use uh, other minis. I think in the first rule book, they had a bunch of models from other ranges in the book, and in each picture, they credited where they came from. And it's just cool. a really cool thing yeah so great game great casual experience um i'm gonna complain about dan for a brief moment ah! that man had access to eight spells and and so there's six turns he has two wizards he cast two spells a turn so 12 spells total 10 out of the 12 spells he cast were all this one fucking spell called blinding light and it was oh, easy no. to cast it went off on like a 10 which is like the the, the like one of the lowest casting rolls and when he got it off of one of my dudes, it made them have a one-inch move. They can't cast spells that require line of sight, which is like all of them. They uh, they can't fight. They can't shoot. They're essentially they're essentially dead, um, but they can move an inch. Um, and in order to get that off, I need to make a, I need to pass a will check on at the end of the round, and I need to beat a fucking fourteen. Oh, it's it's not even like just last it one round. It lasts the entire fucking game and so he neutered one of my thieves instantly first turn i never got that blinding light off he did it to my wizard he did it to my knight he did it to my man in arms and he cast that spell 10 fucking times and it went off i think eight or nine times out of ten and i couldn't stop it i couldn't i had a dispel scroll i took it off one time with a scroll automatically put it right back on and i was oh just like my. dan suck my dick <laughs> He was fucking poning me, dude. He was blasting me with those laser beams. I needed my goddamn sunglasses and SPF 50. It wasn't working. He was getting me. Yeah, it seems like a like strongest spell in the game, and yeah. I don't even know what the other spells do. So what Evan, Evan made an interesting point. He was like a D20 system like you might that you often find in RPGs, like we'll mm -hmm. discuss today, um, is designed to work with like a DM, where the DM's kind of like, you know what? I wrote this encounter bad. This shouldn't happen in this way. I'm going to modify that result to make it more reasonable. Like he mentioned that as like a typical scenario you might find. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so now we took this D20 that's in a system like that and put it into a mini war game where every single result is like final and like, you know, in, in the result. And so that creates this swingy nature in the game where you get results like, you know, he rolled the 20 when casting Blinding Light. 
and I needed to roll higher than 20 at some point in the game to get rid of the blinding light effect. And of course, it never happened. But like he just rolled really well, and so yeah. that kind of that kind of got my dude. Yeah, that can that can certainly be a, a thing in uh, in D and D as well as lasting effects from spells. If you just like roll crappy for a couple rounds, you just feel like you've done you've which because you have done nothing. Yeah, yeah. You feel like you've done nothing, or you like you continually die from bleeding out, and you're like, just fucking put a finger in there and stop the bleeding. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think even though like that happened in the game, like it didn't matter. Like I was still having fun because like, I don't know why, but like, it's really important for me for the experience that's being advertised to me to line up with my experience. Mm. If that happens, I'm, I'm golden. And like I had, and the, the train was beautiful. The, the war bands were all fully painted and it was, it was just awesome. And like the, there were NPCs roaming on from the edge and attacking me and Dan. And it was just, it was that, good. That's a fun aspect. It was to good, it, yeah. To it, was it. Good. it's like it's oh, these are the things that could be happening, and it changes how you play. Yeah, um, I like the D twenty system. The the thought of it, I th- you're one hundred percent right. When everything is tied to a single roll, as opposed to, you know, my barbarian could have rolled with his pluses. He could have rolled a twenty five to hit, and he rolled a six for your defense, and you're just dead. Instead, it should be like. This is the damage roll or the static damage or whatever, kind of like Warcry, mm. that the barbarian does. Mm-hmm. Um, that that would be a thing, and or you can add a critical system too. You know, if if your your attack or your combat roll was ten or more higher than theirs, you get a critical. That's, oh, that, that's, that's interesting. interesting. So it's like I did really really awesome, but he still only does his regular dagger damage. No, it's like I did really really awesome. I daggered him in the lung. Right? That's actually a cool idea, like having the crit based on the difference as opposed to you just rolling like a natural twenty. Yeah, which is, it feels weird when you roll a natural twenty and the opponent rolls a nineteen. It's like I'm gonna, I, I just fuck you so hard. Yeah, it's like I rolled right. a nineteen though. Like what the heck? Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. That, that is how crits are done in Pathfinder. Okay, it's, I like it's, that. It's the plus ten system. I like that. So yeah, but so. I guess the the what I'm getting at with there is when everything falls down to one dice roll for the entirety of all of the results of combat, you're right. That is really set to be swinging. It also kind of hones in um, the flexibility for uniqueness within the game system because everything still falls to one dice roll. So all these minor things that make the different character classes or whatever different, they feel like they don't matter as much. Mm. Because it still comes down to, did I plink you with the arrow or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, the the real spice in that game comes from you picking your wizard and your apprentice. It's, like, basically the way that Don explained it was you have two, you have a greedy wizard who went into a, the tavern and hired a bunch of man-at-arms and soldiers to come and be bodies for him, essentially, to steal treasure. That's the whole gameplay loop. You're, you're stealing treasure. And so, like, the you get, uh, so another thing about the blinding light thing is that when you play Frostgrave, you get to make your own warband and pick your own spells. And as a necromancer, that, that was my warband, I can pick uh, uh, spells from the lore of necromancy, but I also have other affiliate lores that I can pick from and give bonuses to, like witchcraft. Um, and so you can build out your wizard to have, like, all the greatest and, and, and good spells, to have maybe, maybe another dispel scroll. Like, and it's also, this is funny, uh, the, the game kind of lives, especially in a campaign system. And last night I asked Don, I was like, "Is this the is this the mini wargaming equivalent of the show gets good in the third season?" <laughs> and he was like, "Yeah, basically." Um, but so yeah, like when you when you play the game and you kill people, you get experience. So last night I was wasting people. I was killing everyone, but I wasn't getting as much gold as as uh, as Dan. So like in Guild Ball, it has two goals. If I'm killing people and getting a bunch of XP, my barbarian next game is going to be like ultra kidic because he's oh. going to be like level two, level three, new weapon, new stuff like that. But then uh, Dan got a bunch of gold, so maybe he can buy stuff like potions and things. So because there are two resources to gain, there's a nice balancing effect there. I don't feel so bad that he was blinding the shit out of my dudes because I was fucking wasting everybody and getting oh, a bunch of XP. Okay, so you got to farm the XP while he was just casting fairy dust on everybody. Yeah, yeah. So it's a consolation prize, which is good to, to re- reduce the feel-bad moments. Um, and I, I mean, I didn't even feel them in the first place, but I was like, oh, yeah. So if we were playing as a campaign, I could definitely see how, one, making my own wizard would be more personal and more fun, and I could give him other spells. And two, I'm getting a bunch of XP, and that's going to love my dudes up. So, so you do the campaign, do you just fight each other every single time? I think, I don't know. So, like, there are 
The one we played yesterday, Thaw of the Lich Lord, I believe it's called, is a 10-game campaign. There are four-game campaigns. There are three-game campaigns. Oh, you can cool. string together scenarios in any number of campaigns. Sorry, any number of games you want to make a campaign. Um, and I don't know. I think I think they all come down to just collecting treasure, but I could totally be wrong. I didn't see a single other one. Mm. I don't know. I'm sure that, that there's built-in ways to have it be a more cooperative thing, especially oh, if sure. monsters are coming a, a, from the table edge and stuff. Then, oh, maybe in this this mission, you end up having to work together while like you know, still maybe stabbing each other a little bit. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of cool. The All vibe right. I got was very it's the experience you want to make it kind of thing. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, but yeah, that's Frostgrave. All right, I'm I'm, I'm glad that you uh, you shared that with the goody peepees that people need to know about that game. I've heard nothing but good things about that game for a long, long time. Yeah, I remember way back in the day when I first started in mini painting and got into Age of Sigmar. We started with the Path to Glory campaign. Yeah, baby. And um, GG. It was it was god awful. It's, it's like, <laughs> yeah, because you just d six like like models into your warband, right? Yeah, it was so <laughs> terrible, and it was so half baked and not thought out. But it was like the entry point for for Age of Sigmar, which it still kind of is. It's still around, and they still kind of show it off as that. But every time we have new people, and we're gonna do another uh, slow grow campaign or something. They're like, oh yeah, we'll do Path Glory. I'm like, no 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 no. Do you want to roll off a table and decide what box of models you have to buy next? Yeah. Rob has this great these great set of rules for under 1K point games. If you ever want to do that, I can share those rules with you in there. Cool. They make the, uh, the uh, situation way smoother. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, and so even back then, people were talking about Frostgrave is like, it's like this, but it's better. And I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um. All right, so next thing I had to talk about was the most important factor for a wet palette the most important one yeah this is this is a hot takes i kind of feel like they're all really important to me but uh, i think there's I one can't. okay there's one there's okay. one if this is wrong your entire experience will be fucked okay all right what is and it i never even realized it until this week <laughs> He's about to shit on some wet pellet. No, no, I'm not. It's, it's actually has nothing to do with the specifics of the wet okay, pellet. Itself. Okay, okay, okay. It has to. I realized it while trying out the exemplar wet pellet, with, which with pre-cut paper, with the paper they include with it. Okay, so they fucked up. Uh, which they, um, the paper that they have in there, I think is parchment paper, or it, it looks like a parchment paper. It acts like a parchment paper, which is great. I love that. Um, here's the factor. Your parchment paper, whatever paper you put on it, must be smaller than the dimensions of the sponge. One more caveat to that, after you stretch it and add water to it. After you stretch it and add water to it. Yes. And that may seem like a silly thing, an inconsequential thing, but it is the difference between it holding down like you glued it down with Gorilla Glue or it's starting to ripple in the once the paper starts to peel at the edges, it's fucking over, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> like it's over. We're about to talking to you. It's fucking over, Johnny. It's over. Like all it takes is one little tiny curl and there's nothing you can do. You gotta get you gotta get that paper tight. <laughs> We got the Vince sound effects back, y'all. Here's why you're Woo! wrong. Okay. All right, we got them back. We got a new one. Let's let let's hear the the third one again. Tight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh. Yeah. So do you? Okay, that is what that is what I proposed to the court. Okay. Uh, do you agree, disagree, or or have a different take on this factor being so vital? I think I think this this feature. And maybe like two others or three others are all equally very important. Yes. That would ruin my experience. It's the kind of thing where for so long I haven't used a wet palette like that, that I know the moment that I did that and, and dealt with the curling, it would make me so angry. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that is very important. And it's, I haven't, it's I haven't, small, but it's important. I haven't dealt with it in quite a while because I've been, I've used the red grass one for a long time now. And their pre-done paper, this is one of the main reasons I use theirs is I'm too lazy to cut paper and I have a bunch of their paper and theirs are set up just right. There's like a quarter, when you set it down before it's all squeegeed out, there's like a quarter inch 
rim around where sponge goes longer. Yeah. And then when you, you kind of flatten it out, get all those wrinkles out, then it's like an eighth of an inch all the way around. Yeah. And you that, that never happens. Yeah, that sounds pretty perfect. And I think the sponge itself is a little bit smaller than like the size of the pellet. So you yes. can get water around the sponge. That is another big thing. Yeah. You, everyone needs those little ketchup bottles, the little squeegee tabs. Mm -hmm. Fill that with your distilled water. And then as you're painting, you're refilling, rehydrating if your area, even if your area is not, uh, not really dry in your house or your environment. Still keep an eye on that, but as most especially if where you're painting is dry at all, you have to like constantly be doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but I learned that it's a simple thing. It is not anything that is, is negative to the exemplar wet palette in particular. I just realized like, okay, b before I start painting here, I'm just going to take a scissors. I'm going to like cut a half inch off the length and the width and then put it down and, it, and it's great. But yeah, when you're like painting a model for a video and I painted this in one day, it took me like a full with with breaks to eat like 12 hours to paint that thing and it started to curl about hour three i was just like no yeah. the rest of the day i'm like you just start putting your paint further and further away from the <laughs> curl <laughs> like it's someone with the plague and you need to avoid them <laughs> pretend they're not there Ugh. yeah okay do you got anything else for preamps uh yeah i got a new tattoo oh boy it's peeling right now. We're in the peeling stage. Oh, it's the favorite stage. Yeah, I got like this. Uh, I'll have a picture of it in the screen right now. I got like a seal, a sword and board, and a sick crown that's bleeding. Uh, it's very Arthurian lore. Or also, uh, it's based on. I, I got confirmed in the Christian faith a long time ago with a with a verse about uh, the full armor of God. So it's kind of a throwback to that as well. A lot of references, but I, f I love fantasy. I love knights in shining armor. So like having all this stuff there is cool. It's got a blade inscription on it. I got super nerdy with like sword design and I like went and looked at a bunch of swords and how they changed over like the 15th and 14th century. Pommels, handles, guards, blade width, blade inscriptions. And I uh, made a little layout in Photoshop and then he like kind of tattooed it on me with a little stencil. Fucking tracer, huh? Any tracer right on, dude. Tracer on. Which is very important when you have something long and straight like I that know. sword blade. Yeah. You don't want any kind of, well, I guess it's going to be a scimitar. <laughs> right, because you had a forearm, too, and the forearm yeah. twists a lot, right? It does. And so it's hard to get it straight, but I'm actually surprised, like, how fucking straight it is. Yeah. Um, you have you, like, sit in a, in a position where, like, is your resting arm pose yeah. where it'll show as straight for how you usually do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you have a long syringe on yours. So that's kind of the same exact yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, the thing that I like most about yours, when I saw the pictures of it, oh, I really, and it's funny you say that about the, the long sword design, is I really like that long sword. Dude. Like, okay. it, it looks so fucking good. Yeah. Like, just the width at where it meets. I know, yeah, that chunk right there, right? Yeah, yeah you, that, that feels like some heft. It's, okay. I, I was so picky about that. Like, I really wanted the shield to be the right scale compared to the sword. Mm. And so I went and found the length of a Templar sword from the 14th century and a shield from that same time period. And then I made sure I had the ratio right in Photoshop when I scaled them down. Oh. Uh, because I wanted to make sure that it was... It wasn't wrong. Yeah, it's those kind of little details that once it's on you permanently, you can't unsee them. Yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, oh man... Shields like the size of a fucking <laughs> loaf of bread. <laughs> uh, I got one more thing for the premium. I played Age of Sigmar this last weekend um, against a Cities of Sigmar player. I, I used the old army book. The next game I play, I'll be using the new Battle Tome. Oh, that's right. I'm picking up my new one today. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I got to. Uh, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna roll with Legion of Blood. I think they're the scariest. They're really fucking good. I'm, I'm looking at them wolf. Them wolf vamps. Oh, the Virkos. Yeah. Or no, Avangori? Virkos. Okay. Avangori are the monster vamps. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Um, but yeah, the game against the City of Sigmar player, uh, both City of Sigmar player, uh, players in my league have kind of the same shtick. They have like a giant unit of Iron Drakes that destroys anything in one shot. Um, right, right. And the game was great. Um, I ended up pulling the W out, but I ended the game with Neferata and three skeletons, literally. Oh, oh, yeah. like, I couldn't touch the Iron Drakes. Like, it's difficult because like they will kill you in Overwatch if you charge them with the unit of the Blood Knights, right? Or anything, they'll they'll destroy it. So you need to have a chump unit to charge and a unit charge after the fact, and that's so much investment when there's like so many other things going on around them. So I just I just ignored them and played the objective game. Ended up coming out. 
it was like we didn't play my last turn like when he played his last turn in round five it was i was still winning 15 to 14 if i finished my turn it would have been 2014 18 14 something like that Uh, so it was pretty close um and he killed a lot of shit uh he actually killed my zombie lord to a wound with one shot from the uh the iron the iron drakes he did exactly 14 wounds and then I picked up 14 dice to make 14 deathless minion saves. And I was like, I need one six, and I'm alive. And I can go kill something and gain yes. wounds back. Roll 14 dice, not a single six. Of course not. You fucking, I mean, you fucking dice right there on the spot. I'm like, not. God damn it. He did kill something. Um, he's a, Dude, zombie dragons are insane. Yeah. Um, he, he killed the the big uh, hurricanum. The thing that has like a plus one to hit bubble and like he's oh, a wizard and shit. Yeah. So he killed that thing in one round of combat. Uh, but then it got absolutely ass blasted. Um, I played it poorly. I, I probably could have like been outside of 16 inches of those iron drakes and still killed the Huracanum, which meant that he'd have to move that unit. Because yeah. when they don't move, they get two shots apiece. So I should have thought about that. Definitely my bad. But still won. Uh, but it was it was a hard fought victory. He, he was slaughtering everything with those iron drakes. It seems like a like a really a good example of <laughs> of a of a good game of Age of Sigmar. Yeah. Or like you deciding like. Uh, there's, I'm going to take this tactic that if it fails, I'm going to feel like crap because I'm just going to get shot the fuck off the board and yeah. still lose. I, did, I didn't really play much. you know. Yeah. I, I'm basically like running around, killing things on the outskirts, getting shot at. Get, he has fucking three wizards. They all cast two spells a turn. Mm. He's doing mortal wounds like endlessly. So it was, it was, it was like a lot of running around avoiding stuff. <laughs> that that's, goes to show you it's not a game who can do the most killing. Yeah. So that's cool. That sounds like a fun game. Um, but it also sounds like the kind of a game where you won the game, but the whole game you felt like you were losing probably yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I won. It didn't feel great, though. Yeah. We were playing Prize of the Gala or Gallet, where the second player turns on the objectives and there are five in like a cross pattern. Oh, cool. Um, and so uh, basically I was like, okay, I'm going to take if I win priority, I'm going to take second turn every single time. And I'm always going to play like I have second turn. Yeah. So I never threaten any charges. I play defensively. And I uh, I won Pryo like most rounds. Took second turn every single time, um, or he or he won and took first turn. I didn't care. And so I turned on the things that I, that mattered to me. I got ahead in points, and he couldn't he couldn't get out of the hole. Mm. And also, I mean, there's there is an example of a battle a battle plan that really works well with the double turn mechanic. Sure, yeah. it actually gives you a strong enough incentive to look at the value of taking it and versus the value. Of going second, yeah, yeah, and we should, um, that that kind those kinds of mechanics were probably more consistent through the battle plan. Absolutely. Oh, and also, um, if you want to check out that VOD of Frostgrave, we'll have it linked down below. It's on my Miniax Backlog channel. But also related to that, I was on Warhammer Weekly, and uh, Tom and I talked about that concept you just said, incentivizing going second. And he gave me this really interesting uh, like stra- strategic advice. He was like, "I am always taking second act uh, second activation unless I can end the game." Hmm. Um, and so then he was like, so because of that decision, GW giving me more benefits for going second only strengthens that choice. And so there's that thing in that scenario is also in this particular season where if you go second, you have two heroic actions in your hero phase. Mm-hmm. It's like they're just incentivizing a choice that I'm already going to make. And I thought that was kind of interesting thinking about that. But that's that's some good. That's some sound advice that I'm going to take moving forward in all my games. OK, uh, that. My follow-up question to that statement is, what is your definition, Tom, of end of the game? I think I think it's killing some pivotal thing or amount of things uh, in uh, in the army. And that's that's how I that's how I interpreted it. Okay. With my army, that's how it works. Like in turn, three, you neuter them to such a degree that them coming back is almost hopeless. Yeah, like. In that game against City Sigmar, if I got Pryo in round three and I had a zombie dragon in his backfield and Blood Knights, I would have won that game. But he he won it, took it, and then shot my dragon. But um, yeah, I would argue that a, a relatively any relatively potent offensive force army, in most once once you've gotten close enough, most armies go taking it. Will will end the game and the game turn two turn three something like that yeah, yeah yeah maybe maybe usually one to two that's that's a really s- sketchy yeah but um, the problem is if you invest in that strategy and you don't get it and you're playing against like an iron drakes or like a spell casting thing they will fuck you like yes so it's like I, I just need to play like I'm never gonna get it yeah and a lot of a lot of the well, this is another value of the 
the balance of it is a lot of whether it's buffs from spells or from heroic abilities and stuff a lot of them last until your next hero phase so if you double turn somebody yeah but dude. they had the buffs up they're oh, still up i know yeah dude you're that is so brutal there are some effects that don't last the entire time like the heroic action you can take where your hero gets plus one to his save and plus one to his wound rolls that only lasts in their their turn uh it doesn't last until the next hero phase but like most spells you're right and buffs last until the next hero phase anyways man we this preamble ramble has been so informative there's just so much to talk about so many there's so many things that we're so smart about john and i just withhold discussing literally anything hobby related <laughs> and then we do this fucking show and then it all just comes out <laughs> All right, on to what we painted, eh? Yeah, hey, let's talk about what we painted, eh? All right. Uh, okay, I'll go first. You were talking about Sigmar. I painted this. Uh, this is a Stern Guard veteran, Ultramarine, that wonderful friend of the show, Dan the Man, a.k.a. Danimals, um, kitbashed um, for me f to do this video. Um, it was kind of like, I need to get this video done in like a week, and I'm like, Dan, I know this is, you know, this is not really nice of me to ask, but uh, do you think I showed him the artwork of the cover of Bolt Gun? I'm like, right. I think I can make this. I don't know if I have time to make it to get the video out. Is this something you're willing to do? And he was like, I love Greeblies. So he was like, <laughs> he in in like the pose of the character is just right. We went back and forth on which options to use. Like, I wanted it to be a Primaris Marine. Because I didn't want those little stumpy old Marines, so he feels more heroic. But his backpack is of an OG Marine. His head is obviously of whatever beaky Marines are. And his bolter is from an OG Marine. Because the bolter of the new Marine, it's so big that it just, the scale of everything, it just didn't feel correct. Um, but he had to chop off legs and he ended up having, because he's kind of had this left leg up and he's standing on a chaos dude's corpse thing from the box art. And to give that pose, the angle where he's looking and kind of pointing this gun slightly down. Um, but yeah, then I painted him up in kind of what uh, we'll talk about the style of, of what I went with. Cause I think I may have discovered uh, the something amazing. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was just really Where fun. Where are we going to talk about that? Something amazing, John? Oh, God. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in the after party, <laughs> which is the ex it's the extended uh, portion of the podcast at the end of each episode that, for our patrons, you get access to that. So um, for a couple of dollar dues a month, you can support the podcast, help us keep this show rolling, and uh, you get some benefits, and that one is, is one of them. Nice. Um so, okay, the bolter is not NMM because you're using TMM elsewhere, or are you mixing? Um, the bolter is actually meant to be the same color as his helmet. It uses the same paints. Mm. There's just, v because of like it, the downside being in shadow, I just didn't boost it up a bunch. And afterwards, I was- kind of like doing this, you know? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And so I, I realized afterwards, like I could have pushed like some of the edge highlights and stuff up to that full ivory- more but i was like i kind of i kind of dig how it isn't is taking away too much from the face about being as bright as sure. the face is yeah yeah that's fine but yeah it was just uh, a fun paint job i forgot how much it sucks to volumetric highlight uh space marines <laughs> and to try to rush and get it all done in a single day <laughs> so yeah, you can really nurse a lot of these things, and also Primaris kind of just made it worse because now they're just now, now they're just bigger. Yeah, <laughs> just everything takes is, longer. Yeah, especially the especially the legs. I find the legs of the Primaris are especially a pain in the butt because you have such a giant cone for the from knee to, to ankle, and then plus you got to figure that run those same lights across the thighs, and where the lights are going to bounce across sort of different angles still need to be there. And it's just kind of a pain in the ass to have to put so much work on the fucking legs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was um, it was fun, and that's actually a, a model that I'm gonna after the recording today. That's going in the mail. It is a gift for Rahul Kohli, who is the actor that um, voices that character in the vid upcoming video game Bolt Gun, Very which is nice. a boomer shooter. I learned that that's the name of the uh, 
the uh, what do you call it genre? Genre. Yes, I've never heard of that, and I love FPS games. What does that mean? Boomer shooter means like Doom mask. Doom. Well, oh. Wolfenstein. Oh, see, my game we call that a railgun shooter, um, like Quake or something like that. That's what Quake I was. Another well, one. Is that it's a boomer shooter. Okay, I thought it was an FPS game designed for the boomer uh, <laughs> like generation. Yeah, it is. It is. That's what it means. <laughs> oh fuck! Is that what it means? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's like games, they're not designed for, but they're still built in the aesthetic of when boomers, when <laughs> FPS first-person shooter games were out, which is the boomers. You can also call them hitscan games, too, like no bullet drop. That's what hitscan means, I believe. I, I could have I could have got that wrong. Oh, uh, bullet Oh, bullet drop. So, so you have no bullet ammo? bullet drop, yeah. It is, well, you don't have infinite ammo, but it's not about realism. It's about where I put my cursor, that's where the fucking bullet goes. And it's just oh, like, it's all oh, about drop. being like perfectly on point. That's what they call it a railgun shooter too, because a railgun in Quake is like the quintessential hit scan weapon. Um, it's just like point shoot, like nailed it, um, regardless of, of distance. Yeah, no fucking win, no distance. Like I have the best, you know, cursor accuracy. GG. Um, <laughs> okay. I think Danny Boy did a great job with the conversion. I love how all the purity yeah. seals are blowing in the same direction. I know, dude. It's very nice. It's, it, and it goes right with the art. And like, we, we had some great conversations as we were doing it. And he'd send me pictures and ask me questions. And He's stuff. very professional. He is. Right? I had him assemble my war cry terrain, and he was so professional. It was insane. It's so good. And he was yeah. just like, okay. Here's the thing. He's like, pull up the art for me. And I'm like, okay. He's like, look at how many purity seals <laughs> his fucking parade ribbons he has around him. I'm like, yeah, it's a lot. I'm like, um, I want this one. I want this one. And I want this one. I think those tell the story. There's the three on the front side that tell the story. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I want those. The rest of them can go. And he was like, okay. And then he fucking did it. He just like, just did it. He did it. I, uh, I think the way you mixed and matched the scales was also very choice. I love the blue shadow in the cloth tabard in the um, the purity seals. It really ties it into the blue of the ultramarine really well. Yeah. Um, what's uh, the, what's the side of his helmet too? Oh, oh right, yes. It's all very cold. Yeah, I love it. And then even even the magenta of the purity seals is a cold red, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but it totally is kind of like this more magenta, like blue kind of red color. Yeah, because you keep because the whole thing was. Then just sprayed again. I use that AK primer. There's a primer that's pretty close to like the starting point, which is McCrag blue. Mm. Very, very close. And so then you selectively choose where to keep that. Okay. Um, and it works especially well for for something like an ultramarine because you have to imagine there's a la a level of reflection from that blue armor, however faint, that it's almost like it's a a very faint its own light source so light is hitting it it's then bouncing off the armor and then hitting the stuff around it yeah with a blue added to it so when you keep a bit of that there it, it's like oh it feels more for natural yeah especially on something that's white the white is especially gonna or like a cream color especially gonna show up uh in a big way uh, a, an extra level of professionalism for dan so when dan brought the model to me it wasn't completely assembled and he had already cleaned up and and uh, put together like there was fucking Legos, the different options for me to choose for the final version of the dude. So he gave me a couple of backpacks. He gave me a couple of bolters. Um, there's things was uh, he had them separated from the base. It was like everything was like how I could change and alter it and do the final build and pull everything together. And I switched a couple of little things, but it was like against. I mean, he did ninety percent of of the work, and it was amazing. So that's thank awesome. You. Thank you, Dan. Shout out to Dan. All right. Um, what I painted was Rosie from Neko Galaxy. I've been pronouncing it wrong my entire life. Uh, Neko is Japanese for cat, and they're, uh, or kitten, I don't know what it is, and they have a cat for the logo. Does that mean that Neko wafers are made out of cats? Yes, that's exactly what it means. Um, but I painted it as a 75 millimeter sci fi chick. Um, and at the very beginning of the painting process, I asked my wife, I was like, what scheme should I use? And she was like, you know, Taco Bell cups from the 2000s. <laughs> And I was like, fuck yeah, I do. And she was like, do that. And I kind of strayed from that because I painted the jacket this kind of like lime green color. Bro, there's a Baja Blast coming up in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but she was like, make everything pastel other than a saturated blue color. And I was like, okay, I can work with that. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to do that. I have like a lilac, this like kind of pastel pink, this pastel green, a very strong blue hair color. Mm -hmm. And then all those colors just kind of come back everywhere else in the model. I really like to paint like that, where you like, here are my five colors, 
and I'm just going to reuse them in different ways across the entire mini over and over and over again. It's such an easy way to make a, a model that just like comes together, right? I don't have to think a whole lot about it. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of fun. Tried to make a East Asian skin tone as we talked about last time. Mm -hmm. This time is more about finishing that leopard prints uh, on the on the clothing. Uh, I did like a little Hello Kitty freehand on the socks. The uh, her left leg is a little bit more jank than the than the right one. The one you're looking at right now is definitely the better of the two. Yeah, it looks really good. Thank you. Um, I actually really am proud of how the jacket turned out. Even though you can't really yeah. see it from the front, I think some of those blends are nice and soft. On the back, yeah. Yeah, um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I like how that leopard print turned out. And I really love how this fucking hover skateboard is so, it's so silly. Is this but, a um, toy? Or so I bought a tech deck. Okay. And it was too big. Oh. And so what I did was I then figured out the right size for the scale of the model she is. And then I cut out three skateboards on my, my vinyl cutter. Mm. And then I used the tech deck as a form and I rubber banded these thin pieces of styrene to the tech deck so it followed the curve. And then with them rubber banded, I hit it with a hairdryer for like three minutes. And while it was attached, it melted and kind of uh, formed to the shape a little bit. There's, it's not as exaggerated as the skateboard is, but it's still a little bit there, yeah, you know? Is especially, it's actually kind of like that it's not as curved on the front, but it's more on the back. Yes, yes, I did that intentionally. That works really well. Um, I also, this model awkwardly has her head pointing down, and I thought a little clever way to fix that would be to have the hoverboard angled up a little bit, and so the rod on the bottom, it was cut on an angle, and then I scored the bottom and added, like, some uh, epoxy, the rod itself is not attached to the base in case I wanted to change it and like put it on like an actual sci-fi base instead of just like a black standee. Yeah. Um, but it's it's there for now because I you know I'm I'm running out of time. Honestly, you're really good about noticing you have little time left and then taking the steps necessary to finish the thing on time. When that when this happens to me. I just get like sad and I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, I don't have time to do the cool things I want to do. And so then I just do the cool things I want to do just more slowly. <laughs> more slowly. <laughs> this is my, this is my toxic trait. Um, oh, so, oh. so I, I did all the cool things I wanted to do. Maybe I didn't like paint the skateboard in a cool way, like on the bottom and shit like that. Um, no, I don't, I think, well, your line of viewing angle for it too, you're basically never going to see it uh, unless you go, peeling up and looking for it which right is like, there's enough details under there too with the hose and then you have these like mario kart when they little, come off the little ground. pucks kind of yeah i assume those are actual wheels that like in mario kart when you go off the ground then <laughs> they, they go <laughs> and they, they go in right i, I thought that. it was like little boosters that kept it hovering or something like that I mean, but it could be whatever you want it to be yeah whatever your imagination tells you yeah but like her foot posture is perfect for oh popping a manual like yeah. isn't it yeah it is i was like this just works out too well to not do this like i couldn't just put it on like a plinth yeah. um and so and it, it took me like i don't know maybe like three hours to make the whole skateboard and paint it and shit i got to use a cool stencil yeah it's a whole new uh idea around the tools you have to make it work for what you're trying to achieve yeah and i used uh, sandpaper for the grip tape uh, on top of the skateboard um but yeah i'm okay. really happy with the model a couple things i i really like about this First of all, she's got fucking golden Uzis, and that's dude. Cool. I know, dude. I know. Okay, uh, the shoes are so good, <laughs> dude. Eric Swenson popped in during a stream, and was like, "You know what's weird? Painting the shoes on that model was the most fun thing." And I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take some time and paint them nicely." Then yeah, they look and they well. One, you're talking about reusing colors. They just work. Mm -hmm. It looks like. She planned the outfit out. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. And, yeah. and they just work. The yeah. shoes work with it. Two, um, egg. I had already mentioned the the free hand of the Hello Kitty is like legit. Like it <laughs> looks like a freaking uh, a stickery do decal. Um, that's decal. the word. Um, and the last thing is this is a small thing, but if you don't do it right, it doesn't portray how you want it to. And you did it right. And I'm sure it's not as easy as it looks. Is doing the leopard print so it actually looks like leopard print, where not all the circles are closed. Yep. There's fat parts on some. Yep. They're all not uniform at all. Thin parts too. Yeah. yeah. Like it just. There are some spots that are just just the blue outline and not. There's no pink in the middle. I really spent some time looking at leopard print, and then I tried it on paper first. And then I tried different colors as well. And I was like, certain things work better than other things. And I really figured out a lot of stuff when painting it on paper first. And then I did it on her, and then I started on her butt, 
which is like less visible mm-hmm. and then moved around to the front of the waist and then uh, worked up to like the the bra area so i did like the most important part last when That's i kind of really kind of warmed up the most really figured it out yeah 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 i think the color combination is really good too where he's like well the what the outfit she's wearing is already pink why would you also have the the leopard print have pink but it works perfectly because it makes it look like it's an actual like a uh, like a fabric pattern that yeah. they would design to look good this way. And it's, yeah, yeah. Like it's really people cool. liken it to something called Liza Frank, which is like a oh, Lisa Frank. Lisa Frank, which yeah. was like a, that, that adorned like book covers of like school children in the two thousands. Is that what that was? Oh, it was earlier than that, my friend. Earlier than that, okay. Yeah, as in like nineties. Uh, it was like a mid. At its height, Lisa Frank was mid nineties, I believe, but it was a big deal. It, now it was a girls' thing. By and large, because it was all lot, like a lot of like horses and puppies and kitties, like you know, running across the stars in weird shit and like <laughs> and, and vibrant, vibrant ass weird neon colors, and that was it. And so it does give a Lisa Frank vibe. I think if it would was was like even way more like super saturated neon, it would more. But more I rainbowy. I don't think the model looks better painted that way if you did it that <laughs> way. Maybe I don't know, but that that looks great. That's yeah, that's something you should we really be proud of. And I think you're at the three D printed base that you did for it. It feels very um, like complete, like no detail. Um, really feels phoned in. So mm-hmm. you could certainly take that to a. I would I would enter that in that competition. Even it's just like it's really cool. People should see that in person. It's really cool. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I might I might bring it to Monty. I might fix some things up, like uh, like the underside here is like totally unpainted, mm. um, and stuff like that. Um, I might I might put it on like more of like a you know concrete base, like you know like a gutter or something like that that looks cooler. Oh, um, well, now that you've designed that, you could probably oh yeah. Because you have that little nipple that it's that the thing is attached to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you popped it off of that, so you could paint the bottom, and then you could design one where you could just like sink it in just a little bit and then glue it down, then exactly. you could have a flat mm-hmm. concrete street. Yeah, I measured that with my caliper, so I know the size of it, and I also know like how much tolerance to need to actually fit in there. Because when you, the thing I forgot about three D printing is that when you cure it, the the resin print it it, it can it uh, contracts a bit, right? Um. So if you make a perfect sized hole, even with a little bit of leeway, and then you cure it, that hole closes a tiny bit. And now suddenly your rod doesn't fit anymore. Um, so I had to reprint a couple times. I like the motion you just did. Yeah, that's that's one for the video. Yeah. Uh, the viewers the, on YouTube. The viewers are gonna see Scott's <laughs> fucking what are those things? The shake weight motion. <laughs> <laughs> Shake weight. Uh, all right, that's what we painted. This week's sponsor is Gamers Grass, and they're here to show off their two new themes for their Battle Ready Baseline. Battle Ready Bases is a series of pre-finished bases that come in a wide variety of sizes and shapes to help you quickly and easily bring your miniatures from your hobby space to the game table. They come decorated and painted, so all you need to do is to apply a few dabs of glue to the feety feats of your models, slap them down, and you are ready to play. Gamer's Grass already sells a wide assortment of realistic bases from a winter landscape to urban warfare, but this expansion of their line is focused entirely on sci-fi. Spaceship Corridor is the first new theme they're adding to the mix. Rusty metal floors featuring all the greeblies, broken equipment, discarded tools, floor vents, exposed wiring, and more. The color profile is exactly what you'd expect from rusty metal space debris. The way the rust effect contrasts with the dull blue grays of the floor really produces the derelict vibe they're going for. The second addition to their line of the Battle Ready bases has been dubbed Alien Infestation, which delivers on exactly what the name evokes. They feature slippery floors covered in alien goo, unusual tendrils creeping around the ground, alien eggs, and some critters roaming around. The bases themselves have common design elements to Spaceship Corridor, but the rich blue hues along with the vivid magenta come together in a wonderful contrast that seeps with alien vibes. Maybe useful in Demon Ship? Demon Ship! Oh, it's probably better in Ghost Boat, actually. Okay, maybe. And since the designs are related, it wouldn't be difficult to combine the two schemes into a single unit or display with a the theme of slow corruption or an invasion. Gamer's Grass is casting these two sets of bases with a new type of thermoplastic injection called CO-Cast. It's a cheap, recyclable alternative to resin. These new bases also feature something that hobbyists have been asking for, magnets. Every base in these two new sets will come with a slot specifically for magnets to help you carry or display your miniatures. 
A big thank you to Gamers Grass and their two new lines of battle-ready bases for sponsoring today's episode. You can see all the links of them down below. Now let's get back to the video. Chocolate Rain. Chocolate Rain. Hello, doggy. God, that guy has a funny name, too. It's like his real name, and I can't think of it right now. Zay John Jay or some oh, shit like that. It's Tay. It's Tay Zonde. Tay Zonde. Yes, you, 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 so close. Thanks. Access to corridor in my brain. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, today's podcast topic is on Tay Zonde <laughs> <laughs> and his prolific streaming career <laughs> post Chocolate Rain fame. <laughs> Joining us for today's episode is Tay Zonde. <laughs> <laughs> Psych, we're not talking about any of that. <laughs> what are we talking about, Scott? Today, the main podcast. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> all right. <laughs> For today, the main topic is John and I discussing the things that we like about miniature war games and about RPGs. And it's going to be structured like a little bit of a debate. And so I'm going to be representing miniature war games and John's going to be representing RPGs. And we're going to share the things we like about them and the things we don't like about them. Also, caveat before we get started. Magic the Gathering is better than both of them. <laughs> As someone who is getting into and still enjoying Flesh and Blood, I, I mean, you know, I it definitely there's a there's an element of a card game that just is just better than both those things. Yeah, I, I definitely get that. Yes. Also, bullets here. Oh yeah, we have a bullet joining us today. Her brother is at the vet. Mm -hmm. and we don't trust her alone. No, she uh, she's a terror. So, but she's good when she's with people. So she's kind of just hanging out. And the viewers see her cute little flower that's on her collar. Oh, little flower. Yes, they can. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yeah, let's talk about some. Let's talk about some games and let's discuss the things that we like about uh, them. In, you know, in generalities. Okay. So let's start with it, Scott. What is one? Big thing that you like about tabletop war games? I love the physicality of it. You know, mm. I love the pieces, the models. I love the visuals. Um, I, you know, I love like board games. I kind of came up to miniature war games through board games, playing Risk, playing Access and Allies, and all those games have pieces for their figures. And I, you know, I grew up, you know, playing with action uh, figures and GI Joe and stuff like that. And so I love the tactile nature of all most miniature war games, that, uh, where there are figures associated with it that visually represent all the things in the game. So even terrain, everything. I love all the physicality. Oh God, yeah. We said that this is going to be us uh, arguing with each other, but we're going to start out with the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Um, that is one hundred percent the biggest thing for me. Probably, and not even like I consciously think about it as such, but like it probably is the thing that I love most about them. Yeah. And for those of us that are, those of you that are probably listening are doing so because you like to paint minis in some regard, or you wish you could paint more minis, you had more time for it. Either way, you enjoy the hobby side in some regards. And I think the people that are more inclined towards that are more excited about what you just said. Yeah. That visual aspect and seeing the cool things on the table. And I really think that tabletop RPGs do that really well. Uh, excuse me, tabletop miniature war games. Tabletop RPGs can also do that. Yes, definitely. Um, unless you are a barbarian like one Vince Venturella. Tight. <laughs> That plays without miniatures. Now I here's why you're wrong. I <laughs> got him. Um, actually, Vince and I had another long discussion about this when I was painting for um, my Golden Demon piece, and we'd be on Discord calls for like eight straight hours, <laughs> ten days in a row. Um, we got on this topic one time, and he he made a lot of points that I like really kind of agreed with. Yeah. Um. In in not using miniatures in tabletop RPGs, and a big part of that, I think, why. I came around to being more open to doing that. As one, it reminded me of in games that I play, specifically one shots or things like kids on bikes where we don't use minis at all. Um, the kind of the freedom of being pulled away from the the kind of the pushing you right into what you're visually seeing. Um, but also because I play tabletop uh, war games, and because of that, I can still satiate that great like visual aesthetic right and so it's like oh i still get to experience it from that side and i just love painting models and looking at them on my shelf and looking at other people's painted models 
that will kind of scratch that itch. I don't need that. But you're right. I actually think that, um, <laughs> to make your argument for you, I think that tabletop war games do it better because you get to kind of set the parameters from the get-go of the game. So you have the whole mat down, you have all the terrain set out, you have all your armies, all the models you're going to need. When you're in the middle of a game of D&D, you'll be like, oh, the party decided to go like break into the castle when I thought they were going to go out and do the mission out in the countryside and I got to find the right fucking models and I got to put out the board or I got to find the little train things and oftentimes you just it's going to take too long so you don't you just draw with a white erase board on the thing here's the rooms you know you throw a couple little tables or doorways on there and it's not as wholly immersive visually so I think the the war games are better at that yeah uh, that's exactly that's exactly the point. Like the everything that has a visual element in a miniature war game is built into the system intrinsically, and it's like you don't have every option in the world available to you like you do in D and D. It's just so hard to have to physically represent all the possibilities that you can encounter in an RPG. It's just like it, like some people do that. Like I saw like a video of some guy in some insane basement with like a bazillion different models in it. And it's like, yeah, some people can do that. Like one person on planet Earth can do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, it's just not it's not as easy. It, it's more it's more built into miniature war games and thus easier to accomplish. And it happens more frequently. Yeah. And with the tabletop RPG, you don't have to just paint all your stuff for what you need. Mm -hmm. You need to paint all your stuff for what you might hypothetically need. Yeah, the possibilities, yes. Yeah. Yes, and so very often, even like our group, the amount of painted minis that we have and the amount of pre-painted minis we have for our uh, Pathfinder game, um, we still are using counts as, right? And they're still, they're always quite close. It's like, oh, instead of a, uh, you know, a whole legion of dragonborn here. They're actually like half of those guys are like lizard men. So they're kind of close and they yeah, look close yeah, enough. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, it's still like, oh, not exactly. Yeah. Well, they don't all have halberds there on the table. Right. So, yeah, it's all about the theater of mind, right? Like you can you can imagine it. And honestly, flexing that muscle in some ways is good. Flexing your creativity is good. But like to me, the prospect of like, OK, I got this army. I have these units. Like, how do I see them in my head? I'm going to go out and hunt for that model, try to like bring it to life. Or maybe the company makes a model that I like and like, see, like mm -hmm. having that thing that I read about in a lore book or read stats of and then have it like, you know, physically manifest. And then I paint it like that whole process is very satisfying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my first thing. How about you? What's your first thing for okay. TTRPGs? Yeah, we're going to since you started on like kind of the, the actual miniatures side of it, then mm -hmm. I'll do I'll do mine from the miniature side of it before we're actually digging into the games themselves. Yes. And that is how satisfying it is for me to find a miniature I love or see the DM put a miniature on the table that's painted that is perfectly that boss monster or that cool dragon or even a really notable recurring villain or I find an awesome looking model at the store that oh my God, this would be awesome for my next character. Being inspired by the mini side and being excited about painting up my miniature character, knowing that character will get more table time than any fucking model I will ever paint for a miniature war game. <laughs> In one campaign of D&D, &D, that my character model will get more time on the table and more time me pushing it around and seeing the paint job and all that than anything in a freaking war game, even if you play a lot. I mean, I'm sure there are people that play uh, way more than me that that's not true of. But for me, I feel like either the, the wow factor of me putting the big scary monster that I painted on the table as a big boss, it's so much cooler because we're kind of in it together instead of, oh, let me make sure I'm doing my rules right. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, that's a zombie dragon, um, blah, blah, blah. Like something about the satisfying nature of the hunt for a cool model, discovering a cool model regardless of what range it's in, and then knowing that, oh, they're going to love this. Oh, I can't wait to do this. And and being like, oh, you said for your next character you wanted to play a swashbuckler. I, I found this fucking swashbuckler mini at the source. Take a picture of it. Send him like, do you want me to pick it up? Like it, something about that related to the miniature hobby. It feels so it feels so good because as a reoccurring thing we're going to get to throughout this conversation, it's more about doing things together than opposed to each other. And even in the hobby, it's that way. Yeah. Yeah, and some miniature war games do what John is describing. Some games that lean into that model agnostic, um, like nature. But just mm -hmm. just like with the my first point, 
D&D just lends itself more to that creative hunt for the right model because there are no there are figs made by the company that owns D and D, which is the Lo- Wizards of the Coast, Wizards of the Coast, yeah, um, yeah. But like again, there are so many monsters. There are so many different kinds of characters you can make. There's no fucking way anyone can make models for all that stuff. So you got to hunt. You got to hunt for them STLs, for yes. those, those dark sword mages, for them reaper mages. You know, you got to yeah. find the right one. Yeah, and it's like, well, yeah. There's a lot of goblins, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's like if you're playing a goblin character, you want to find a weird one. You yeah, want to find dude. one that's unique. You want to find one. It's like you want to have the hipster goblin that it's in this small boutique company that sells their STL files. <laughs> My buddy Blair did that for his Kabold dude. He was like, can you print this for me? I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> He's like, I found it from a blah, 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 blah. And they're out of like fucking Chechnya or something. <laughs> and it's I printed it out and it looks fucking amazing. The quality is awesome. It's like holy shit like this is great and something about that that hunt uh, we go through that every time if we had recently had a new buddy join our group and he's playing a half orc um that uses a bow that's made out of the monsters that he's slain he's like how the fuck did we find a model for that <laughs> sure shit we did if you dig far enough i mean you can find awesome awesome stuff so that's awesome so yeah that's that's it when we we're talking about the I think we can all be touchy feely on the side of if we like to paint models and we like little tiny men's like <laughs> this. We're they're both these hobbies are great for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it actually f- feels good about doing both because then you feel like you can double dip. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no rules about that at all. All right, what's something? What's when it gets to the games themselves? Get to the games. Right, well, um, I am a naturally competitive person, and miniature war games, for the most part, are one v one competitive games, PvP. Yeah. Um, and so I love that. I love. I, I don't even care if the the scenario or the game is uh, like a competitive or ultra balanced thing. It's even fun just to play more of a slapstick game like Frostgrave. Um, against an opponent and, you know, kind of like, cause like, it's like, you, there's shit talking going on. Like Dan uses the same spells eight times in a row. I give him shit for <laughs> it. You know, it's all fun. All of it's fun. It, the game doesn't need yeah. to be like ultra balanced and competitive, even to like have fun being a PVP game. But, but for me personally, as an individual, I especially like it when it is ultra balanced and very competitive and very crunchy a very, a very much so satisfies something inside of me so yeah that, that's the next thing okay yeah and that um here's why you're wrong <laughs> um the reason you're the reason you're wrong with that is i am also a very competitive person which is why over the years of playing tabletop war games i understand why they're uh terrible at that in before he mentions magic the gathering um i mean there there are plenty of examples in the world of other forms of uh competitive games that just by nature of how they work are just better. Um, sure. <laughs> so I don't know, chess, maybe that's an example of a, you want a competitive game that's really balanced. Granted, I mean, you could paint up, you could use miniatures for all the things on a chessboard. That'd be pretty sweet. And that's actually a balanced game where you feel like the competitive nature is rewarded. I have found that by and large, especially them. I mean, a lot of this comes down to interpersonal people things, right? Because we're playing with another person, and that can totally change, even if you're competitive, um, what the experience is like. So there's a big asterisk to this. If someone's there and they're like, yeah, let's let's play a game. One of us is going to win. Let's have fun along the way. I have a totally different experience um, than... I am somehow emotionally invested in this tabletop war, uh, tabletop war game with how many dollars I spent on the models, how much time I spent to paint them, how much stress I had over learning the rules and hoping I remember them all over the feelings of gotcha or feelings that I lose on all my die rolls and I feel like my things aren't doing the things I'm doing and I'm spending four hours of my time to do this to just feel like shit the whole time. Those feelings are more the norm than they are the exception. And I don't think that I am in the minority that feels that way. Like all things, you surround yourself with the people that have a positive environment. It becomes a positive experience. But anytime you look to play that game, as you say, in a competitive level, you want to at least feel like I could go play at a tournament. I could. I don't necessarily am going to, but I could because it's a competitive game. And then suddenly you get to that kind of level. Mm, suddenly it's not so fun to actually sit and play the games. 
And I just don't feel that. I'm like, if I want to play a game against other people that's competitive, there are a bazillion uh, video games in the world that do that better. And uh, granted, they're not face to face, you know, unless you sit on my couch and I'm kicking your ass in Smash Bros. But I just feel like it's it's such it's not good at that. It's not good at that from the competitive side. From a and then it's really weird too because like if we want to get together and have fun together, let's have fun together and not have fun opposed from each other. And that's why I was like, let's play a game where we're all doing this together. And that's why RPGs are just better. They're just doing it together. You're not doing it against each other. That's like your opinion, man. <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> I don't know. I've played in a couple tournaments for games that I genuinely like, and the experience was entirely positive. You know, I, I lost and I did not mind losing. And I felt like I had a plan going in, and my opponent's plan was just better. Mm. I think you just play shitty games. <laughs> I think that's the <laughs> uh, but no. So absolutely, you you brought up a very valid point, which I want to be an entire episode topic. But it's like when you play a game, the emotions of your opponent are in some way your responsibility, right? And, and likewise for your opponent, your emotions are his responsibility, his or her responsibilities. And so it's like um, when you sit down and you make that social contract where it's like, what kind of game we play? We playing a competitive game? We playing a, a casual game? What kind of list are you bringing? Is it in, is it is it intense? Am I going to bring an intense list? Just that you align your expectations is incredibly important. But the problem with that conversation is sometimes it doesn't even work because people's definitions of a fun time are different right yeah so someone's like yeah i want to have a fun time my fun time is absolutely fucking shit stomping you yes and so it's like okay i didn't understand that but now that i understand that as a player i'm just going to avoid playing you or i'm going to be very specific about what i mean about a fun time so but you still have to have that suffer experience right yeah it's it, you're exactly right it's like uh, to me most players even players that like play regularly in tournaments and stuff like they are not masters of understanding the every intricacy of the game. Right. Or even close to that. They were like passably proficient of their own army, let alone what you're doing. So what we do is we get we get to meet up with someone, we play a game, and we're more focused on making sure, like, okay. We're just doing all the shit right. Yeah, like I'm trying to do all the shit right. When the more important thing is just like talk with them before you roll any dice, before you get your models out or whatever. It's just like, hey. You know, just have a, a normal, like, let's set these ground rules. But it doesn't have to be, like, so serious like that. It'd just be like, all right, my list is is I, I, it, it's trying to do one fun thing. Now, one fun thing is there's a bunch of these uh, dwarves that are in tin cans and they're carrying around fucking bazookas. And I'm going to just, you know, I, my goal is to have to have them shoot all the cool things. That's that's the cool thing is they shoot all the things. And you're yeah. like, okay, that does sound pretty cool. I like that. Uh, I have a bunch of skeletons and zombies and... Uh, I'm hoping that they'll get in your way and and you know they'll you come blow back, them they'll, up. They'll come back to maybe life. Maybe they'll come back and blah blah. Like if you have this conversation, where you set these ground rules, that I think the rest of it goes well. There's two problems with that. One, it it just doesn't happen. Or one of the, one of the two people needs to have good enough communication skills and understand that and to be able to make that conversation happen. And two, we're dealing with real a really fucking nerdy niche hobby. In no offense, there's a lot of little fucking weirdos that play these games. People lack people's people skills. Yes. Yeah. And it's going to be very hard to make that social contract. It is. With people. It is. Because like, even if you do make it, there are people like me where it's like, if I pick up, if I, if I, <laughs> if I even detect the slightest bit of competitiveness from my opponent, I am 100% turning it on and <laughs> ramming it down their throat. Yeah. Like if you and I play and I detect some <laughs> some fucking movement, I'm like, okay, you're fucking going down now. <laughs> so that's 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 a me problem, right? It's like if if like if you break the contract, I'm gonna break it. I'm breaking it even harder. I'm gonna shatter it. Um, I'm gonna break so, it over your head. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna kill you with this contract. Um, so that that there's that problem as well. And this is where game design is extremely important because some games are just designed to not be taken seriously. And it's so like Blood Bowl is a fantastic example of this. It's like. Man, at any point in any action I play in that game, I could fumble the ball. And at that point, it's just my it's my now it's my opponent's turn to start playing with his army. And like I can't I can't I can mitigate that risk, but it's going to happen. 
it's gonna happen at awkward times and it's like i can't do anything about it yeah and it's like that game has a billboard that says don't take this seriously i know and it's so it's just like it's so easy to with that kind of game to not take it seriously so i think that's an important element yeah and if you get that right and you get the expectations right of the players then it's a good experience but you're right it's a minefield for sure yeah i and i think like those kinds of games are probably for people like us they're probably the healthier games to play yeah you're right um you're right and when you get into that the, the issue that i have is so often that c word competitive is used <laughs> is used it in really top warwick games and like as a selling point right? you're right you're right and it's it's often a misnomer yeah or their definition of what makes it competitive and i'm just like i mean let's let's look at competitive video games and my definition of what makes a com competitive video game competitive is that there are like actual tournaments where actual money's on the line where actual world ranked players have to build up the ladder or qualify for this event or blah 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 and they only can have such a structure in place because they're actually balanced and skill matters and understanding of the game matters and luck is involved but it's so much t smaller of a factor at the highest levels of play yeah and that's where i'm just like that my your definition of competitive, my definition of competitive, because of my background, and then getting into uh, tabletop war games at an older age, that's I'm I'm just at a different wavelength. And so when I hear that, and then when I experience it and see it on the table, those are not the same thing to me. And do you feel like your experience is is flavored too much by Age of Sigmar? So I feel like probably I feel like a Song of Ice and Fire really does a good job of giving you that competitive experience where not only am, am I on lock with my own army, but I realize what my opponent is trying to do with the table across me, with what his list is trying to do in his faction, what his faction excels at in just in general, and I'm going to play around that. Like mm -hmm. I, I really feel that interaction in that game when I play it. It feels competitive. Maybe it's not super balanced. Like right now, you know, like you can see on a Song of Ice and Fire stats, like what what factions, what houses are winning the most and who, who's losing the most. So sure. like maybe the balance isn't there, but they released these small updates to kind of like bump things in certain directions. So I could see that from what I had played of that game that I could definitely see that because it feels more reined in, first of all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely it is. Yeah, yes. it's, it's reined in. And I don't mean that in a slight on the game. And I actually think that that's something if you want your game to use that C word, like <laughs> you have to be <laughs> reined in. I, You're right. Yeah, it needs to be conservative. It can't be explosive and super swingy. It needs to it needs the peaks and valleys need to kind of get reined in a little bit, yeah. le less amplitude. Yeah. And go, but the reason that that kind of game like that or that specific game doesn't excite me is goes back to the very first thing that you talked about mm. is the miniatures and everything on the table and that that aesthetic that white dudes versus white dudes just doesn't appeal to me at all yeah and i it, it's important honestly you know and which is fine and I, I don't think the game should burn in a fire because that's the way i feel about it i think the more options we have um as people that like these kind of games the better mm -hmm. um and, and it's a kind of slightly different genre the skirmish style but with guild ball guild ball really did feel like it was, it was super tight <sighs> super tight however guild ball felt like what are you, are you gonna press a button? I'm trying to press a button, but I don't know how to get back to the other sound effects. Oh no! I think we did this last time. Did we I, couldn't get them back. Did I nuke them? Do you duke nuke them? All right. Uh, my issue with a game like Guild Ball that is super tight and very complex and very there's there's a lot of shit going on, is it just feels like I wish there was a computer that would do all this shit in the <laughs> background that I don't have to manually do stuff. So takes for fucking ever. Yeah. But it requires that of you to have that level of complexity and, and real competitive nature to it and uniqueness to not only every single faction, but every single character and combination of characters and how they synergize within your team and all the choices you make on who you pick based on synergies. It's phenomenal. I just want my fucking computer to do all the fucking <laughs> behind the scenes maths. I have a friend, uh, Ian, who has the exact same critique of very complicated board games for, for, the, for that. He's like, I just want a fucking computer to track this shit because I'm gonna fucking forget it and it's gonna like not gonna the the experience is not gonna represent what have should have actually happened just because i forgot this one small fucking detail yeah so I, I get that critique for sure yeah um my my next thing for what makes tabletop rpgs better and this is something you alluded to earlier is that you have the ability because you have a human behind the screen that is kind of 
choreographing the story, the events, the combat, the interactions with the world, you have full ability to improvise and adapt. So the game stays fun for everyone and it's not too easy. It's not this was broken and now you're all dead forever. It's and sometimes that can happen and sometimes that should happen. Sometimes you gave everything, every bit of information clear to to the characters through their interactions with the world that going down into the lich's lair is is a, a recipe for certain death until you find the secret chalice or whatever. And you've given them enough world information that you're you just made a bad choice and I don't feel bad about it. And then the lich, you know, just sucks your soul and uses you as like, I don't know what he uses you as, but something. So but in the moments, you can keep the action exciting. You can create cinematic moments within the game. And as long as you're able to do that, you're always going to have a fun time. And you're not reliant solely on these fully able to be seen dice rolls for all players. So it's like, shoot, we're 15 minutes into this and I'm just, this is just going to be a sweaty, scrambly mess for me to try to not hate my life after this game. <laughs> and just the flexibility. That's it. And in any time, and this kind of leans into a bigger thing, which is when you deal with... Um, competitive games or a game where you're facing another person where you can't have that you can't have ambiguity because we're we are these are the rules of the game and that the rules of the game determine the outcomes the rules of the game we're all understanding the rules of the game and something like dungeons and dragons and so we all understand basically how i can attack a monster and how i can do all these things but the nuances that you can implement that especially done in a way where the players don't feel like you're taking the foot off the gas or they don't ever un and they never are aware of the fact that 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 monster they just killed it way faster than you thought it should be killed and it never the monster never got to do its cool thing which then changes the whole layout of the dungeon and blah 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 it's like actually you didn't kill it it actually has twice the hit points that i originally thought it had so we can make the cinematic crazy fun moment happen yeah you're alive writing loop rules right yeah. and which is yeah in a co-op game where you're trying to create an experience some kind of narrative that's such an essential part of the game right you don't want to be hemmed in by like these you know kind of static rules that you can't work around and you know i kind of wish miniature war gamers would be more like that honestly I think people, and this is this is regarding all things, um, models and rules. Like people are so precious about what models I use to represent my army and what what rules we use. And it's like, yo, if you and I don't like a fucking rule, let's not use it. Like yesterday, there's a crit rule in um, Frostgrave that's optional, but it creates these weird moments where if I roll the crit, my opponent could roll better than me with all of his additives and he still loses the combat and when you crit you do like ultra damage it's like that's just dumb it's just dumb yeah. and so Don was like we're just not going to use it it's like why doesn't that happen more often 90 percent 95 percent of our games are happening between us and a friend right mm -hmm. just make it the experience you want to make it dude like you know, if you don't like the fucking double turn or you don't play AOS, just don't play with the double turn, you know? It's right. like, the, I mean, basically, I played, the game I played on Sunday was that way. No, not a single person took the the double turn priority. Not a single time. It was just back and forth. And it was like a very close game. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. Sure, if you have the game solved and you're some fucking tournament player, you like the surprise of who wins Pryo. But for the majority of us noobs who have no idea what's going on, just alternating back and forth is totally fine. Yeah. So I, I do wish that that element of TTRPGs was more of a thing in the casual version of our hobby. Mm -hmm. I think a rough part about that, and this is something going back to, you know, as a young kid playing Magic as opposed to playing Dungeons and Dragons, because I did both, was that if I had a good group of friends, like the kids in Stranger Things, right? And they were really good friends and they could sit down and they could play Dungeons and Dragons and work through a campaign and, and learn about the stories of the characters and the stories of the villains and all these kinds of things. You just needed a couple of friends that were all in the same wavelength. If I'm playing a game that's a tabletop game or even something like Magic, you really 
want to play as many different people as you can because it's different armies different decks right yeah you want to yeah you you need that that subject matter experience so you can know what's coming i want to know if my vampires how my vampires shape up against orcs but my three other close friends that i really enjoy playing this game with none of them play orcs so then you feel this level of having to venture out and to really experience the whole game and it it just creates this God, I know I'm going to run into morons, and you inevitably will, but maybe you'll make more new friends that enter your fold to regular playing. And so it can be tough. Even for an extrovert, I always feel like playing someone I've never played before and I've never met them before that like I'm committing to four hours of what (laughs) very well could be a shitty fucking experience. Yeah. I'm using my limited free time as an adult to do. Yeah. And that's just hard. I used to do that as a kid. I Man, I totally forgot about that experience. Like, just going into a game store and be like, who wants to get a game in? And it's like, you just play the person that's there. Yeah. I don't do that anymore. I only play friends that I know. Yeah. Uh, I kind of, you know, you know, I lied. I, when I, back before I started the gaming stream, I went to a Song of Ice and Fire night at the source a ton. I went every single week. And I would play anyone who wanted to play a game there. And it was... It was fine, but you were right. Like, yeah, those people could be assholes. They could be weirdos, and it's just like, you know, this is just kind of a bad experience. But it's it's interesting how, in that competitive scenario, it's like so much of the experience is reliant on the person you're playing against, right? It's a it's an interesting conversation. Yeah, and going back to something like, well, say playing freaking darts or playing billiards or playing magic. If I show up to the pool hall and I play a guy. And it's he's a terrible human being. Well, that game of pool took like 15 minutes. Mm. You know, time is a big part of it. Mm-hmm. And that's a big fucking downside to, to tabletop war games is the time commitment with that flip of a coin <laughs> that I'm, I'm not committing a shitty. When I played, I played two magic tournaments last week, Friday and Saturday, and each one is three rounds. And I played an entire a pre-release tournament in the same amount of hours as it would take me to play one game of Age of Sigmar. And I got to play three different people, three different, you know, fun versions of decks, you know, win or lose, you you play and then you'd keep moving. And then in between rounds, you still talk to your friends, you shoot the shit, you buy a do, you fucking <laughs> snort some smelling salts, you get back to round two. And like, it just, it didn't feel like it was just like, I am just like in this quicksand you know, and he's just screaming at Trey. You, and he's just like, "Let me fucking out of here!" It's so bad. You know, oh god, you just conjured up the the greatest emotions I felt as a child. Uh, Not a tree, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's definitely an issue with with miniature war games. All right, but uh, I believe I shared the thing I like about miniature war games, or maybe where where are we at? Yeah, I sh- I shared. Oh, you did. It's my turn now. Yeah, it's your turn. Okay. I feel like we are in the beginning of a golden age for miniature war games. We are in the first year, two years of it, and it's going to get insanely better in the next couple of years. Like People are really cracking open the definition of what a miniature war game needs to be. I think Malev was talking to me about a, about a miniature war game that was about, I don't know if it was walking dogs or something like 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 outfitting animals and cute outfits or something weird like that i saw one where it was like herding animals was it case okay, so yeah maybe that's what it was god damn how funny it would be if those were two fucking different games <laughs> <laughs> but it's like there are so many different kinds of games coming out that you can really pick whatever one you want to create the experience you want to create like you can play uh um the new D and D onslaught game. If you want like a dungeon battler, you can play Frostgrave. If you want more of a casual wizard building experience, you can play space station zero. If you don't want a competitive experience and you want a cooperative experience, you can play demon ship. If you want a solo experience and play by yourself, there are so many ways to cut the cheese and we're, I think we're just getting started. I think this is going to really blow up in the next five years. And so it, it's very exciting to be in that kind of environment. Whereas as someone on the outside of our, a tabletop RPGs, and I could be wrong about this, it feels like y'all have figured it out. And the changes that are now being experienced in those are 
slight changes, changes to format, changes to settings, you know, different kinds of mm-hmm. settings. So we're using the D&D rules, but here's this layer on top of it. It's like now we're playing in the Gloomhaven universe. Now we're playing in the Star Wars universe, but it's still at those same bones. And so excited to feel this energy. This, it's it's kind of like this. So we're at the beginning of something new. I'm sad that you said cut the cheese and I didn't make a fart reference. <laughs> um, you didn't I, have one in the fucking chamber? Yeah, dude, I did not have a fart in the chamber. <laughs> I wish I did. Uh, I put it right up to the mic. Uh, so one of the things that, that tabletop RPGs, while they had such a bigger head start on that, is simply logistics. You All you needed to do was to be able to write words down. <laughs> yeah, and, fair, yeah. Right? And you could make your game. It required nothing else yeah. other than, I mean, publishing was certainly the biggest issue it back in the day and age of where you had to go through one of the major publishing houses to mm-hmm. get it actually produced but now you don't even need that mm. I and mean, you can just like go through a website and have a mass produced yeah. stuff and make your stuff but i think um there's two things that well there's one thing that i think is really interesting in regards to what you said and we're dealing with like like uh, the third stooge in the room here um <laughs> is board gaming yes and i think board gaming is it's going to be so much um, going to open up so many things, so many uh, doors for both of the sides we're on. Right. You're now. totally right. They they are the real trailblazers and have been for the last several years. Mm-hmm. And so what they do is they expose people to the like deeper down the rabbit hole, which then puts them in, you know, in our camps. Um, but they also blur the lines like the deeper board games are getting the more in the more. I don't want to say complex they're they're getting especially with the uh, addition to having apps that can track oh, that can do yeah. all those kinds of things that they're doing more and more of that which I think is going to continue to evolve and improve as well the more those games start to feel an awful lot like like an RPG like, an RPG. like a miniature war game miniature yeah. war game you're absolutely right and that's that's not a bad thing because I think the more you blur those lines, the more you open things up to people that like certain aspects of one, but maybe not the others. For instance, every Saturday I have game night with Dan and Alexa, and it's just the three of us, and we always play board games, but they're always cooperative games because Dan doesn't like competitive games. And I'm like, I totally get that. And I'm like, I'm glad that you're that way because I like competitive games, but I'm also competitive (laughs) yeah you get your fix elsewhere right yes i can do that elsewhere and instead we can just have fun learn the game together achieve the things in the board game that feel satisfying for all of us make decisions together because it's starting to lean more in the rpg side the games that we play and some of them um like the lord of the rings uh journey into middle earth journey to middle earth that game is fun if, I really enjoyed that game. A lot of aspects of that game was more like a miniature skirmish game. Yeah. It had a, a whole extra phase to it that wasn't that way, so you right. didn't feel like this is all the game is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the actual encounter phase you're talking about. Yeah, because it also had like the world map encounter phase too, which felt more like it had different levels to it and the boss fights. Anyway, that game's fun. You guys should play it. It is fun. Yeah, I totally agree. <sighs> um and uh, yeah, so I, I think that those things are, are going to continue to evolve, and I think What's happened is the the evolution, sorry, evolution of board games has been so rapid and successful that I think, like Malev was talking about, we're going to see more of an evolution on the tabletop wargaming side, especially on a, a smaller scale games. I don't think we're going to see a lot of that in the full wargaming. You're side. totally right. I mean, also, Demon Chip could be a board game. Yes. Couldn't it? Yes, it is a board game, <laughs> right? It's just like what I mean. It's a solo solo board game. It's like what, where, where do we even draw the line anymore? It's like it's 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 almost hard to know, right? Um, and honestly, I I don't care about that. I think I've I've heard some people who are like miniature war gamers, but they don't want to play board games. That doesn't make any sense to me because to me they're like they're the exact same experience. Um, well, maybe not the exact same, but ones with models feel like the exact same. Yeah, I think the I think the bigger jump for me is from my experience in hearing is people that are like. You can be a normie person and play really nerdy board games because they're board games. So it's not. But to make that jump to say, I'm a really nerdy person. I really like fantasy stuff and I'll play awesome board games. But playing Warcry, that feels like a 
that feels different. <laughs> if you had to assemble the models, then that's where yeah. that's where I draw the line. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh that's a really good point though. Uh we haven't been arguing as much. We need to get to the things we dislike. But Yeah. Okay. And then so do you have anything left for tabletop RPGs that you like or do you want to get straight into the I game? had I had one, but um so okay, so there's one. Well okay, on so there's time. all right. Yeah. So okay, so I have one, but I'm gonna flip it to the the thing I don't like about uh, tabletop Let's flip board it. games. Okay, I don't like <clears throat> that nothing I do in this game really changes my army for the next game. Okay. Yeah. In role playing games, it's my character evolves. He gets stronger. He gets cooler new abilities. I get to figure out how to, how how I want him to make be different or better. And when I play a tabletop war game, it's always the same. Now, the game never plays out the same. There's so many factors involved. So I appreciate that. But I also feel like as someone that's like, I want to be invested and being invested will make me want to play it more. Um, I feel like I'm not really invested other than I like I like my army, how they look. That's why I picked them or whatever. I don't have any investment in them. I'd be like, yeah, they just fucking nerf necromancers. You're fucking out of the loop, bud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fuck out of here. You suck now. Like hey, they're fucking ninety points now, though, bro. That's it. They are a single caster for ninety points. Yeah, with- but I, yeah, I just, I, I, it bothers me. I spend so much time building, painting, list building, whatever, <laughs> and then they're just like, I don't know who the fuck those people are. They're just dudes. Whatever. It's my dudes. It's like when I play play D and D. Not only do I know all these things about me, I learn all these things about the world, the villains, and my the my party and and you know what's their thing and so when a thing happens and they change it matters to me and no event in a tabletop war game matters all that much you know and i've played i've actually played a game there's a full campaign uh of age of sigma we had a campaign we had a fucking world map we had shit that happened we had things that when you you own territory we had you know artifacts you could go after and whatever and it still felt so Lamo. It was like a shitty version of like uh, if we played the actual Age of Sigmar RPG that there is a game. My buddy Blair's buying all the books for it, and we're going to play it at some point. It feels like I would just rather do that. Right. It's like so again, you can play games that make this experience better, but because it's so hard to physically represent every possibility of like growth and expansion in your character and your story and your world with physical stuff in a miniature war game. They just don't do it as good as an RPG because the sky is literally the limit in an RPG. You can do whatever you want. Right. And in, in a physical game where you got to represent that stuff, it's, it's much harder to do that. It's, it doesn't lend itself to it as nicely. And so it feels a little bit more kludgy for sure. Um, there are board games like hate where like every time you play, and this is the same of like Kingdom of Death, right? There's like a village phase where like in, in that battle, okay, I, I have captives. I can either eat them or I can torture them. And that gives me a different resource. And then I can spend that on an upgrade in my war band that I bring into the next thing you know, during during this uh, this crusade I'm playing. Or what is it called? Some, some of the C. It's not a conquest. Whatever the campaign's called. Competitive. Yep. <laughs> that C word. I'm um, still going to accidentally say the C word somewhere in this episode. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be okay. We're you not know, Australians. We can't do that. Okay? Oh, yeah. But I think you can if you're British, too. Oh, is that? Okay. Okay. That's allowed. Yeah. Both of them can. Yeah. So if I use the accent. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Fair. Um, fair critique. Fair critique. Yeah. Like, yeah. But that's a little bit more of like m- my personal taste, right? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and so I take it with a grain of salt, but it's just something where it's like, oh, that's that's what I feel. Okay, what's what's something you don't like about RPGs? I think the main thing that I don't like about RPGs is that I just feel awkward while I play them. You know, it's I'm I'm so I'm this is definitely a personal problem. I'm definitely I'm just so wrapped up in like how, how, what I should be doing, how I should be acting, how my players should be doing things that I just am unable to enjoy the game. It's like with a miniature war game because everything is predetermined. The rules are all laid out. The models have physical representations. You just kind of just play the game, and then everything happens, and you can react to it. I don't. I feel like I don't have an opportunity to react to the game in an RPG because I'm just so wrapped up in what I should be doing and how I should be acting. Like I know you don't have to like make funny voices and and like and like have like diatribes and monologues with your character and explain like what the magical effect looks like. But I feel like if you want to get the most out of the experience. You should do that. And I feel like I'm not interested in doing that. 
It's funny that you say that because when we played at Vince's, you had such great descriptions of all your warlock spells. I know, but that's because I was like thinking about it, like on like while you were doing your turn, I was like, okay, what am, what is it going to look like? And I'm like, not, I'm not invested in what you're doing because sure. I'm just so wrapped up in my own sure. bullshit, you know? Yeah. So um, like, yeah, I, I'm not interested. I'm just like, that's that's not what I care to do. So I, you know. Yeah. Oh, you feel like that's that's what you should do for you to get the most most out of the game, and because that's not really you. You just you you don't really want to do that. Yeah, so it's like mm-hmm. I, I could totally play, I could play an RPG and not do the thing that it feels like you're supposed to do. But it just feels like okay, I'm just not getting the full experience. Right. Well, I think one of the val- my my counterpoint to that is that one of the best things um, that I really enjoy about RPGs is that that um, each person can have a different thing, a different kind of player they are and what brings them satisfaction in the game. And you can all play in the same game and have totally different things that you get out of the game, things that make you happy. And you can work together well, um, and you don't have to be Tyler. the the real-life bard, right? That's over the top and explaining everything and trying to you know, convince the king that he should just give him all his rings and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> you don't, There's people that really like that, and spoiler, I'm one of those. Um, <laughs> And, and they love that, that, that ability to interact with the world in a really deep way. But there's a lot of other people that like things in a different way. There's, there are people, and we've had one in our group before, that they like to be a part of the team, but they're an observer. And, they, and they, when they come up with an idea or they do a thing, it's rare, but it's always great. Because they're just kind of like taking in everything and they're, they're having fun and seeing what other people are doing or what the world is doing. And there's, there's this wide gamut. And I think coming from something that's very black and white, like a tabletop uh, war game, where it is like, it's my turn. I do These are the things I can do. I choose one of the things that I think is best for me. And then we move back and forth. It's a totally different mindset. And I think the big thing is the people that, will, that stick to something like D&D for a, a while, and they're in a, a, like a, a positive environment what they play. Because just like in war games, there are what I would consider neutral or negative environments at a D and D table. Mm-hmm. So you're playing with some good people that aren't pushy and aren't pressury and you realize you kind of find a groove of like what you like. And then you just be like, what I think is the key moment for most D and D players is when you realize it's not about knowing what's the best spell to cast or how I'm going to describe this thing I'm doing, but you somehow you flip a switch where it's like, I I understand my character well enough to think about what would they do in this situation. And it's not about game actions. It's not about um, knowing my abilities and my spells or any of it. It's just like this is who they are. If this environment, this situation was put upon them, this is what they do, Mm -hmm. right? And when you get to that, and it's not about the rules anymore. It's just about playing playing out what happens, and it's not about acting it. It's just about um, I have a buddy who plays a shuni in our game and a shuni is a pug person is that when you take a shot through a shoe yeah oh, no that's a shoey okay wait go it's, ahead. It's, <laughs> it's very similar so yeah it's they're dog people but they're um pugs and so he he doesn't role play a lot but he he likes to be like you know some shit happened and the freaking monster uh threw his dagger across the room to try to hit one of us and it comes to his turn and the dog looks at the guy and he looks at the dagger and he looks at the guy and he runs and he grabs the dagger off the wall and he fetches it and brings it back to him. <laughs> it's just like, that's not, that's the bad guy. But he also plays him like he's a dumb, happy dog. He's like, yeah, yeah, okay. And he's like, no, that's the bad guy. He's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> like, like and it's it's just, you don't have to talk a bunch or whatever. It's just like playing, just playing it out is so much fun. And that's why there's, there's such different genres here. So we're not comparing apples to apples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so basically what you just did is you took my critique and you explained why it's an element of the RPGs that you actually enjoy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's interesting, right? It's the same thing, but we both look at it in different ways. Right. All right, cool. What's one thing about uh, TT, uh, about miniature war games you don't like? Uh, well, we talked about a bunch of the things. Yeah, we kind of, I, we actually touched like, on them as I brought things I up. Like, um, I have one more thing about, about RPGs. Um, one thing I don't like. Um, I feel like there's such a this level of fear in myself 
with those with the games. Again, I'm going to lean back to Age of Sigmar, and maybe it's better than others, but I think it's pretty consistent. Where it's like I have to worry about and strategize for and research on so many things that I actually shouldn't have to care about. And that is having to deal with all the things my opponent's stuff can do. It's like, cool, you're playing lizard people. Oh, you got a big fat toad that's your leader. Awesome. Look at you got a T-Rex over there. Sweet. Okay. Well, if you don't understand this rule, this rule, and this rule, and how they work together and how he's lining shit up, you're gonna get fucking wrecked. You're gonna you're gonna make one wrong choice and lose the game. Yep. And I just feel like it's it's like booty traps are everywhere. And I have to commit myself so much to just feel like not fall in one of those traps. Um, and it's it's not any particular game that is egregious for this. I think that's kind of how the games are designed, that you do cool things and how the things work together, what you're trying to achieve. And it's as simple as, uh, yeah, you actually put Neferata one inch behind this line of skeletons when you put her should have put her 1.5 inches back yep. and now Vince on turn one sends his fucking cabbage crashing through and kills Neferata and a unit of skeletons it's like oh and look he's also nearby a skeleton unit that happened to be also engaged with him and he gets to use his excess attacks on that unit and he killed both of them yeah the kind of things like had like, I known can we edit undo that whole thing real quick <laughs> <laughs> right harshest yeah. learning lesson ever <laughs> Right. And the problem is, is you're going to have a minimum of one of those harsh learning lessons every time you yeah. play a new army yeah. and every time there's a new book for that army yeah. and every time there's a new edition and every time there's a new general's yeah. handbook. And here's why your game sucks. <laughs> it's definitely exacerbated by AOS just because of how many factions there are and how often they get updated. But that is definitely, I mean, even though it's maybe a big problem in AOS, it's a slightly smaller big problem in other games like absolutely right in guild ball every single player has a unique player card and they all have traits they all have a different playbook they all have different roles they want to accomplish and so it's the same thing it's like wait you can stack damage like this and kill my player in one activation i had no idea it's like well yeah i'm the faction that kills people it's like oh well fuck <laughs> <laughs> yep um so yeah it's that yeah for sure. A lot of uh, the, the the thing you're describing now has a classic word. It's called a gotcha. Yep. Yeah. There's lots of... Lots there's, of gotchas. If I have a gotcha and I'm playing a game of StarCraft and I you know, do a gotcha there, it's like, oh, fuck. All right. I lost this game. I learned my lesson. Cue up. You know, every next time I play Protoss, yeah. you know, I'm like, look for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, Just you think know. of StarCraft in like 18 <laughs> factions. Dude. Yeah, yeah. How fucking ridiculous that It'd would be. It'd be ridiculous. Yeah, it would suck. It would suck. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. One last thing about D&D that I don't necessarily like is that the experience is very dependent on the DM and the DM's experience in the game. Like, I played a campaign with uh, my buddy Mark and a couple of friends, bless his heart. He had never been a DM before, and the experience was boring, and it wasn't very fun, and every session took fucking four hours, and we did fucking nothing, it felt like. Yeah. And so I was just like, man, this is kind of boring. And so I, it, there's this asymmetric element to D&D where it's like you have the DM who a ton of weight falls on their shoulders for world creation, for thinking on their toes, for having a fair, fun experience for their players, and then the idiotic player who just shows up with their fucking dog person. And it's like, I want to be an idiot. It's like, fuck you. You're ruining my world. <laughs> uh, so it's like there's this interesting relationship and responsibility between each player and like what their roles are. And if you're bad at it, you're going to fuck the thing up for the entire party, right? If you're not good at it. So you got to find someone who knows what they're fucking doing. But if like you're trying to get into D&D with your friends and you're all like, oh, we want to play. It's like, well, who wants to be the DM? It's like, not me. Like, I want to just play and have a character and I want someone else to do all that fucking work. Yeah. And then no one wants to do that work and then we just don't play. Uh, so yeah. there's that element to it. Every group, every group of friends, like, was, I mean, I saw this entirely when I was a kid. Every group of friends needs a responsible friend, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you're the responsible friend. Sorry, bud. You're going to be the DM. Why? Because if it was left to any of the other ones, it's it's ne either never going to happen. Or it's going to be total ass because they didn't put any work into it prior to the session. Right. Yeah. You need to have to do that. Um, you are 100 percent right with that comment. Um, however. There is a wide spectrum of skills, of styles for a DM that work, and yeah. that are good. And so it's not like it's a scale of 1 to 100 and you just fall somewhere on this solely vertical line. It's much more three-dimensional than that. Oh, absolutely, that. yeah. It, which is great um, because just all different people have different personalities and different things that they do well. And you can still be successful. But you are 100% right that at the end of the day, 
if the DM, at the very least, this is kind of a minimum for me in playing an RPG, doesn't give everyone the opportunity at the table to do the fun things they want to do and then allow that to roll with it. That doesn't mean you're successful every time. It allows you to play within the the sandbox and to be able to react and to show that the world is changing based on what you did in the sandbox. If you can do that, you can do a whole lot of else wrong. Mm. But that takes experience. That's the most that's the most important thing. Yeah, you need some reps, okay. You need experience. But um if it's bad, it's bad. And I think, I mean, <laughs> we, we do rotating DMs in our group now and different styles, different levels of experience, different innate talent, I guess we'll say. One thing we've tried to do, and it's hard, um, you need to be willing to have <coughs> open conversations afterwards. We'll do it either like, usually it's when things, you know, get a little rocky, but we try <laughs> to have, it's really hard to not hurt people's feelings. Yeah. Have open conversations to be like, Here's what I'm feeling. Here's an example of what laid out. Because you really want to give people concrete examples of things. Of this is what I'm feeling. And here's an example of, of that. And why, how it made me feel. And how is there, is there a way that you know we can work together on this? And it's not about giving the DM homework to get better. It's about having open communication lines. So in the moment, in the session, you're not halting with an argument. You're not just shutting down because you're not having fun, but you're able to say, okay, well, I get that, but what if this? What if this? And the, some of the best DMs are the people that allow the players to, they go, well, they actually do some of the world building and world interacting too. And I like to do this as a player. I'll be like, I go into the store and there's a little old lady in the store and I ask her if I can buy her an apple because she looks kind of hungry. And I, I play out a, a scene, like a half of a scene, the front half of a scene as a character. And then, and then I say, she looks up at me and she's alarmed. And then I throw it back to them, especially for my new DM friends. You kind of help you because mm. it's cooperative because you're doing this together. You help each other. So you help them. I have no idea what she's concerned about. I have no idea that in her eyes she's seen me before. Okay. Whatever. But let something will play out from that. So, you know, that's the great thing is in D&D, you're helping each other. You need to remember it is not DM versus players. We're all working together to tell a story. And that is why D&D is better than Warhammer. I, that's such a John characteristic, you know. You just love to create chaos and then walk away from it. <laughs> like that's so. Like c considering that, like yeah, dude, RPGs are perfect for you because <laughs> as a player or a DM, you can do it both times. Yeah. What What's that song? Is the song is like cool guys don't look at explosions. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was based on Transformers and like who's the fucking director of Transformers movies? What's Michael Bay. Michael Bay. Yeah, it's a Michael Bay thing. It's all the clips from back from the eighties and all the movies <laughs> yeah, where yeah. the guys are slowly walking away yeah. from explosions. Oh yeah, that too, hundred percent. Is that a Lonely Island song? I don't even know. I don't know if it's an actual song or it's kind of like a joke, but maybe it's maybe someone definitely made a song out of it. Yeah, it's definitely a meme song from YouTube or something. <clears throat> all right. Any more comments? I'm I'm all fresh out. Yeah, I think this is it. I think this ended up being a little bit less controversial in fighting with each other, but I think we also uh, agree to disagree on some of the things. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it comes down to different strokes for different folks. You know, percent, hundred percent. You know, and I I was like I'm not stopping playing Age of Sigmar. I don't know if I'll, when I'll actually play a game again, but I in my head I'm a player. Yeah. And I'm working on my next army. I'm thinking about it, doing a video of starting up another army and all this kind of stuff. It's like, I like that. Dude, Warhammer's so fucking great about like this building inside the of you. The pregame. The pregame. Yeah, dude. The best pregame ever. <laughs> dude, Warhammer's got the best pregame. I'm saying, I'm saying Warhammer universally. But if you have a certain uh, tabletop uh, war game that you like, dude, the pregame, nothing beats that pregame. Yeah, that's dude. a part of the game for sure. Yeah. <laughs> It's the yeah. reason Games Workshop is a fucking billion dollar company. It's all on the pregame. <laughs> That's why you spend money. Pregame spending, baby. Yeah, dude. Dude, you bought seven hot dogs for the first inning. <laughs> That's that's the fucking analogy of Games Workshop. And then you had to pee no, the, the halfway the through the game. The pregame was hanging out in the parking lot beforehand, tailgating. That's what the yeah, pregame is, dude. Dude, that's where the primo brats are. Yeah, dude. Right? And then you're like, you found out you drank one too many Coors and you just never go to the game. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. I don't know how often you tailgated, but like honestly, in Wisconsin, 
as a student function, like if you got like good grades, we would tailgate Miller's games, sorry, Brewers games all the fucking time. Dude, Miller Park the fucking tits. That's why. I know. We like literally it was like twice a year, three times a year. We were tailgating at a Brewers game like all like the time. Was this like a school function? Yeah. As kids, wow! They drove us there on the bus, and we fucking eat hot. We wouldn't. I don't know if we, maybe we didn't even go to the game. Sometimes we would oh, just yeah. tailgate and leave, but then we'd also maybe go to the game. Uh, I can't remember, but yeah, we did it a ton. Yeah, we got to go to Twins games when I was a kid for yes. for stuff because these dirt cheap tickets way in the fucking upper 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 deck. And uh, but yeah, our big thing was was not getting to do that. We got to go to Valley Fair, bro. Oh, nice. Yeah, Dude, when you're cut, that close to Valley Fair, bro. Cut them kids loose. Just, yeah, just fucking let her rip. Don't fucking die, Dude, but this have fun. The, Dude, this was the 90s. We'd have like 80 kids, a bus driver, and one chaperone. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> it was like you never knew who was like hanging upside down from the goddamn the Excalibur ride and yeah. shit. You didn't. You didn't take roll call. You fucking Timmy might got lost there. It's all right. Timmy's parents didn't give a fuck. They're like, all right, I got another one. I got another Timmy. Look at this. Yeah, look at that. That's dude. the eighties, bro. Yeah, it was like fuck it, clo- it closed at six o'clock. You best <laughs> fuck, or you're missing the bus ride. <laughs> that's that's life, dude. All right, on to the news. <laughs> oh shit, we still got news. I don't think we got a lot of news today. Well, I think we always have a lot of news because James is a fucking champion. Hey, 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 hey. All right, I got. I added one thing which wasn't really news, but I wanted to talk about it here. Okay. okay. I want to do a little bet- betting line, right? Um, what's the? This just came to my mind the other head. What's the over under on the number of painters that will have uh, submitted a piece for Golden Demon in Adepticon? And Warhammer Fest, like a month and a half later. How many painters? It's got to be pieces that didn't win that are worth resubmitting, which basically are any finalists. So are you asking like the percent of the entries? No, no. I just like a number. Straight number of painters. I think we're going to see 10 pieces that were... Not pieces, painters. Dude, because Mammoth will four, hit ten four, on his own. Four, four, <laughs> four or five painters. Yeah, I, that's that's what I'm thinking too. Because I think Mammoth well, even if it's different ones, because Andy Wardle's going, and I bet he's gonna have something new, because he has a fucking Necron he's working on the custom thing that that yes. looks fucking sweet. Yes. So Andy Wardle will. I'm sure Mammoth gonna do something. I'm sure he's painted new shit and uh, reworked some old shit. Uh, NRM Paint, I think, probably will. Um, okay. Yeah. Colin, Colin, that had a bazillion pieces. They're all really well done. Okay. So already at four. So I'm gonna say somewhere in the four to six, and then the what I'm gonna do then is because Andy's there, I'm gonna ask him afterwards for this number. Okay. So we get. So we know. Okay. 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 So then I better I better mention to him prior to look for that. Otherwise he'd be like, I don't know. So I better ask that because I was just curious. You know, it's an interesting thing. It is an interesting thing. Okay. Yeah. All right, next news. Honestly, there's a lot of really interesting news to talk about. All right, um, Baltic Mercenaries closed its campaign, grossing $6 million. Are you goddamn kidding me? Making it the 22nd highest grossing campaign of all time, fifth highest grossing miniature focused campaign behind Frosthaven, Kingdom Death 1.5, Marvel's Outside, and Witcher Old World. Fifth highest, $6 million. People love this game. Why did Marvel Zombicide make so fucking much? Are you joking? Ugh. Zombicide plus Marvel? I know, but just like, all right, so I'm a part of some Facebook groups that are like buy, sell, trade of like, of like niche uh, board game stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So people will like sell their old board games. You couldn't, you couldn't give away most Zombicide <laughs> boxes like a, a year after they're out. It's like people don't actually fucking play them. I would figure enough people that backed them by now would be like, no. Okay, honestly, that is true, but that only happens because they're being purchased way more than any other game. So I true. have been super into buying used Blu-rays now, and so mm. I go to like half price books, I go to cheap, I go all over the place. And the fucking ones you see the most are Star Wars, are Marvel, are all these ones that are like ultra popular. And I think it's sure. because they just get bought a lot. Yeah, know? it makes sense. It makes sense. All right, what else? What else? What else? Battle deck? Fuck. All right, so... <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, Warren- I just you're just like BattleTech. Fuck. <laughs> was- All right. Anyways, <laughs> uh, Warhammer Bolt Gun, as uh, we talked about earlier in the episode, the trailer is out. For the, it says the tailor is out. So the guy who, who makes all the clothes <laughs> yeah, is out. Um, so anyway, we talked a little bit about what that is. And you can pre order it on Steam right now, but it's also available end of May, PS4, PS5, Xbox Series One, and PC. 
All right, all right. Um, Corus Belli announced a new board game based on a chapter from the backstory of Infinity. So it's a board game that is being designed by Ramper Design. So they're working together. It's called uh, Asheron Falls. Interesting. I kind of feel like they have a lot of shit going on right now. Um, they have like their their board game that's also a dun- that's also a skirmish war game. It has the same fucking name. I can't remember what it's called. Um, they have like Infinity. They have like the, the- War Crow. Warcrow, that's it, yes. And then they have like the the simple version of Infinity, and then they have like this new board game coming out. Like they're they're doing a lot right now. They just uh, I was gonna mention this earlier because I was meaning to bring the models with. They just sent me some Warcrow models. Um, oh, just, they just came. My house arrived like two days ago. Okay, where the fuck are they? John? Um, I forgot them, God but they're it. not ones I have seen before. They're the they're bad guy ones. They're not all the fucking good guy ones like you. Guys. Okay, the fucking, the fucking print quality. Is amazing. Are they pewter? They're not pewter. Siocast. Sci- there's, I think they're Siocast. Okay, okay. But they said they said that they're gonna be poly polystyrene. I don't know polystyrene. I hope their minis aren't made of polystyrene. <laughs> <laughs> they're made they're of pink foam. Pink foam. <laughs> Uh, Mantic showing off a new faction called Twilight Kin. This is a new model range for not not model range, a new army for the faction. So total new design. Let's take a look real quick. I took a look already, and this is a step in the right direction for the game. Uh, now I think you're starting to get into the, the situation that GW has been in for a while and was very strongly in a long time ago. You just have too much detail on the model, like. When I when I look at this model, this is this is the equivalent of a coloring book where the illustration is ninety percent black. It's like okay, yeah, I can I can color the edges of the armor, but you already determined everything for me already. It's like the only way I can paint this is by base coating and washing it and dry brushing it or whatever. You know, it's like there's just there's a lot of detail. Like the archer on the very right, that's starting to get spicy. That's starting to get me like mm-hmm. half chub right there. Yeah. But the other dudes, there's just a lot going on. Yeah. Personal opinion. Personal opinion. That, that that's what I'm feeling right now. What are you feeling? Uh, I I one hundo p agree. Like it's not about the the quality of the technology now. It's going to the quality of sculpts, and this is something that we brought up in a recent episode before as well. Like the technology is here to make them look amazing. Now we need the the water level of sculptors to raise. Yeah, because this is like this can look sweet in character art. Like look at the dude. With the sword and the shield, the character art is fucking awesome. Yeah, that guy, yes. The that mo- guy fucks 100%. The model, I, I, I hate it. I fucking hate it. It's the exact same thing because it's it's just planes on planes on planes on planes on planes. It's yeah. like there's nothing, there's nowhere for me to work. Yeah, but the positive story here is this is absolutely an improvement on previous stuff. So oh, yeah. uh, bravo to Mantic for uh, like doing the hard work to have amazing concept art and also some sculpts to back it up. And again, this is just two nerds' opinions. This is not everyone's opinions. Some people, like models like these, lend themselves to contrast paint extremely well. Yeah. It's because of the level of detail. So if that's what you're shooting for, you fucking nailed it. Um, but if you want a little bit more, like, I think it's interesting to think about the painter's experience when painting your model, when sculpting. Like, you want to leave, you want to leave some stuff for them to do. Okay. Something interesting here. Warhammer Old World announces Don't base even. bases will increase from 20 millimeter to 25 they millimeters. Just, they they just want to fuck with you. In order to accommodate the posing of newer models. But the models themselves will not be getting any larger. So they'll be the same scale. The new rules will reflect new base sizes and new bases will be available for purchase as well as movement trays. They just want to fuck with you, bro. What I get out of that is, is nothing to do with the increase in the base sizes, but it's more of the confirming information that is last that I saw wasn't confirmed exactly what old, old world was going to be. It seems like it, they're just like just re-releasing new rules for whatever... Warhammer Fantasy Last Edition is. I hope that's not what it is. I hope it's a... I have no idea. I haven't been reading any of the Old World articles. When they baited me like three years ago, I was like, fuck this shit. I'll just wait until it comes out. Yeah. Um. I hope it's a whole new game. I hope it's not just fantasy with like some new trimmings. But honestly, GW loves to fuck with their audience. They're like... The standard size for fantasy was 20 mil square bases. All your infantry was on that. Mm-hmm. It's not anyone who's fucking waiting around still has to rebase all their goddamn fucking models. And it's like, damn, okay. You know, it's like, I get it. Maybe you wanted to have more creative stylings and poses and stuff, so you needed more space to do that. It just sucks, you know? It just sucks that you now, like, all the wood elves that I did not rebase still have to be rebased. Um, But I heard that the game is getting released at Warhammer World. This, This one that's coming up. Warhammer Fest? Oh, sorry, yes, 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 yes. 
uh, the where Golden Eve's happening. Someone told me that while I was streaming uh, uh, One Page Rules, Age of Fantasy. What? Like the game is being announced that it's coming no, out? No, the rules are coming out. This is what someone said. Um, okay. So that is very exciting, possibly, if we get to actually see the rules and what it is. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe that person... Well, they they used the fucking dark mark on here with the term movement trays. The, but... uh, the dark mark. Oh, yeah. It's it's rank and fight, baby. Ah. Uh, we know this. This this has been known. This has been known. I mean, it was it was maybe it maybe it has been for a while, but I remember for like it was all speculation and everything. Nothing was clarified then. Yeah, oh, you're right. Uh, in the last maybe like six months, eight months, it was like squares are here to stay. Like that's that's what they said, which implied rank and flank. Oh uh, yeah, I guess that that makes sense. Um, but yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. What else is worth talking about? Mike Hutchinson's Hobgoblin is now available on Kickstarter. So a lot of games like to pretend that they're model agnostic, and they you know they kind of are. Mm -hmm. But this game has model. Uh, ag what's the noun form of agnostic? Agno agnosticism. That that this game has that concept built into the rules in an incredible way. Mm -hmm. I demoed this game, and it wants you to use all models of all base sizes of all scales. It does not care about that, and it writes the rules to accommodate that. Very cool system. If you're into that kind of concept, check out the Kickstarter. Very cool. Welcome to the end of the podcast. This is it. We've we've come as far as we can come. <laughs> Dick jokes, love it. <laughs> if you like the podcast and you want to support it, there are a number of ways that you can do it. Uh, the best ways are through Patreon. Uh, for five bucks a month, you get access to the extended episode of the podcast wherein we chat about things like new techniques we tried out for the month. For me, it was cheetah print. For John, it was painting heavy metal in a fast way. Uh, we talk about a viewer's submission, give them feedback on their model. So as a patron, you get to submit models for us to give feedback to. You also get to submit topics for us to discuss. And often we pull those topics and credit you when we do that. Uh, lastly, we talk about um, models that we love from other painters in the community and why we love them. And that segment often ends up being between 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes long. There's a little bit of extra chatter if you need it for your hobby sesh. Uh, other free ways for, for you to support the channel is you can... Watch our podcasts with ads enabled. You can whitelist our channel. We run an ad every 30 minutes. Um, you can also support our sponsors if you want to. It, it sends a message to them that uh, you know uh, buying an ad slot with us is a good idea. That is, if it's a thing you actually want. We don't want, to, we don't want you to buy things you don't actually need. Um, and also tell your nerd friends about our podcast. Rate us on wherever you listen to podcasts. And finally, we have a merch store down in the description and show notes below as well. Where we sell clothing. We sell fun cups all with the Tup logo on. There's like three different Tup designs, and they're all hilarious and thematic and fun. Check them out in the description below. Teespring. So, you got it all. So, TLDR, buy a Tup shirt, mm. and your life will be better. And like somebody I saw on Instagram today, you'll celebrate your birthday yes. with a Tup shirt on, eating a, a tendy. Ascon, is that what it's called? Ascon. 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 <laughs> All right, so if you're at Ascon, if you were at Ascon by the time that you're listening to this, Ascon is over. <laughs> the ass is over. Uh, this is officially the ass of the episode, and we're gonna catch you in the next one, which will be the head on the flippity flop.